October 1998. One year later, for some, measured in the wink of an eye, for others, a lifetime. What may have been only impossible abstraction somehow became reality. Entire careers were redefined. The masters of their fate couldn't wait for the next challenge. The downtrodden failed to answer the call and could no longer believe. And now, one year later, Syracuse faces all. No matter what this year has produced, the adventure demands the next full measure. The possibility is overwhelming and the rewards staggering. The scribes await the next master of his fate. It's the Eckerd 300, and it's live on Rush Hour. Adventure continues. Rush hour on dirt. We are live at the New York State Fairgrounds in Syracuse for Dirt Motorsports annual spectacle of speed. It's Super Dirt Week 27. Today on the Moody Mile, it's the world's richest race on dirt, the Eckerd 300. Hello once again, everybody. I'm Doug Logan. Welcome to a special rush hour. The Eckerd 300 is all about fame, fortune, and speed. We have nine former winners in today's field, and crowning a new champion today, we'll see a race driver turn into a racing legend. Joining me is Dirt Motorsports racing analyst Gary Montgomery. And Gary, what is the significance of today's race? Well, it is the crown jewel of Dirt Modified Stock Car Racing. 27 years and they're running. It's a very, very big deal. Winner's share, over $100,000. The total prize money, $365,000. So that makes it big. Over the 27 years of running this event, over 1,000 drivers have attempted to qualify. Only 349 have, in fact, done it. Another 349, only 14 have ever won. So there's a lot of prestige if you can, in fact, win the race. Point championships are on the line as well. We'll crown the Skull Champion here today, and this race counts towards Mr. Dirt. A lot of money has been spent to get here, a lot of hopes and dreams for us to qualify, and then if you can win, it. it is very, very significant. One of the big stories today is who is starting up front and who is not. Are we seeing a changing of the guard in Dirt Motorsports? Well, I think that's right. Dirt Motorsports, over the summer, the situation has changed considerably. The guys that have won championships and feature races and so far aren't winning nearly as much. We've got some new guys rising to the top. Bob McCready, who is, a, you know, probably the biggest name, one of the biggest names for sure in Dirt Motorsports. No championships, only nine feature race wins. Allen and Danny Johnson, no championships. And only a handful of wins, seven for Danny, six for Allen, I think it was. Jack Johnson, a former Mr. Dirt champion, Skull champion, winner here, one feature race win for him. Jimmy Horton hasn't won a race all summer. On the flip side, 33-year-old Billy Decker, breakthrough season for this guy. He has 16 wins in the Big Block Modified Division, three track championships. Another guy on the, on the unfavorable side, a 40-41 Pat Ward, but a breakthrough season for him as well. 11 wins, including a Skull race at Can-Am. He won here, the New York State Fair race. Uh, so there are some young guys coming. David Kamara, 29 years old, two-track championship. He's a factor today as well. So we've had a changing of the guards throughout the summer. I'm not sure it will work for today's race where experience is such a very, very big deal. Always a major story in Super Dirt Week in October here in upstate New York is the weather. With more on that, let's go down to Cowboy Paul Small. Guys, usually the story of the weather is that we have a threat of rain, the conditions are cloudy, or that just basically the weather isn't going to be cooperative. Today we actually have the threat of sunshine. Now, the reason I say that is because this entire Dirt Week's preliminary activities have been conducted under relatively misty, cloudy, and cool conditions. Today, the sun may very well poke in and out during the course of the race. That's going to dramatically change the racetrack conditions, and if drivers don't have some form of a sunny track set up in place, they could be in big trouble as this race progresses. Now, in this race, drivers have to do things that they normally don't do during the course of a regular season. In fact, they have to do it more than once. With details on that, here's our other pay reporter, Andy. Fusco. Syracuse pit stops are an uphill battle. Literally, the drivers have to drive uphill about three and a half feet just to get on the pit lane. Pit lane at Syracuse the rest of the time of the year is a horse training track. The reason for the elevation change is because underneath the horse training track are thick hot water pipes to keep the track from freezing during the winter time. 
Now, pit stops will be very, very important today. The rules say the drivers have to make at least two pit stops. They'll make the first around lap 60, the second around lap 100. But the top teams, watch them to make more than one pit stop in between the 60 to 100 lap window. One, perhaps two pit stops to fine tune the car for the last run of the Chuckers. Back up to the tower. We are celebrating 100 years of pharmaceutical excellence. Eckerd drug. It's the Eckerd 300, and our coverage will continue from the New York State Fairgrounds. We are live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour. Super Dirt Week. The Eckerd 300 is brought to you by... Eckerd, right there with you. Suzuki and your local Suzuki dealer. And by CarQuest Auto Parts. To be the best, you gotta use the best. CarQuest. Doug Logan along with Gary Montgomery back at the New York State Fairgrounds. We are moments away from the Eckerd 300 and you see the starting grid in order. 46 drivers are lined up and ready to go. We've got uh, former champions in the race and five race rookies. Well, he'll start today's race outside the second row. And winning the Eckerd 300 would put the finishing touches on the year of his career. Lisa Chalenza has more on the Franklin Flyer, Billy Decker. Long ago, Billy Decker might have been chuckling just to have a chance to race against his heroes. In 1998, he might be laughing. He has come from being a challenger to being a man to beat. Championships at three different tracks are just some of the proof. Beating Billy Decker is no laughing matter. Billy remains one step away from greatness, but it's a big one. Decker's teams have lost at Super Dirt Week in almost every conceivable fashion. 1998's Bug Chaser version has done everything right. It's their time. I think we can win the race, yes. Um, and, I, and the reason why I think we can win the race, we've been over, very competitive there in the past. We've won some races at Syracuse. And we know we can run well enough to, to fend off a field at Syracuse if circumstances play out correctly. And that's, that's pretty basically why I think we can win the race. And, and on top of that, I think our team's ready to win it right now. He's successfully run ARCA, Bush Grand National, and Winston Cup. Jimmy Horton has won Dirt's big race twice, but the wins have been hard to come by recently, and this veteran is hungry. Horton, the consummate professional. His resume impresses anyone in racing. Hundreds of victories, two Ecker 300s. He is always in the race. And this year, to maintain his dirt status, Jimmy towed from New Jersey to central New York every Sunday. That's commitment. Consistency is Jimmy Horton's game, yet his recent inability to get to victory lane has become a hurdle. He races to win and hasn't. But his desire for victory still burns, not only for himself, but for car owners Bob and Michelle Faust. You know, we, we figured we were going to win some skull races in two years. I haven't won one for them, you know, and it's, uh, you know, we've been close. And, you know, they, they want to win Syracuse pretty bad, you know, and they, they give me everything I need. You know, it's on my shoulders to win it for them. You know, we thought we were good last year. and. Um, we just had a miscue in the pits, you know. And it cost us a lap, and we got it back, and, you know, that's when you wish the race was 300-mile laps, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're, we got close in a lot of races, and, uh, you know, they give me all the equipment I need, and I got to thank them for that, and I just hope I can return the favor to them and win that race for them. 1998 has been a breakthrough year for Pat Ward out of Genoa, New York. This likable speedster has found that patience indeed pays off. Did 
Did you ever want to pinch yourself to find out if you were dreaming? Pat Ward might have gone to sleep at the end of the 1997 season and hasn't awakened yet. To describe this year as a dream season is to understate the obvious. He can do no wrong. And when misfortune strikes, it is mechanical or at the hands of another. A journeyman driver for 20 years. Pat Ward has won races in a nine-year-old car. He has always pushed equipment past its limits. And now that the Finch team has supplied him with its multitude, he's taking advantage of its generosity. Right now, he can win any race. This year, we just seem to finally, we've been together, uh, this will be our fourth year, and we've just got all the combinations. I mean, all the money in the world you can hand a guy and he's not gonna go out and win. There's three or four factors in this chassis, motors, uh, experience, and I think we finally got all that together. He's everybody's champion, but Dirt's winning his driver has won this race only once. And starting at the back of the pack, Bob McCready is a long shot at best on a track he simply does not like. It is truly miraculous Bob McCready has won any races this year. An off-season operation promised a year of recuperation and possible retirement. Instead, Barefoot has competed all year, albeit not at the level to which he's accustomed. He comes to Syracuse hungry. Bob McCready's search for a second victory at Syracuse has taken him down some long, frustrating roads. A man who should have won the Eckerd 300 several times has reached into the past for some advice about his immediate future. Just before Kenny Weld died, I was talking with him about Syracuse, and he said, you know, that everybody talks about that place like it's some kind of different animal. He said, all it is is a big short track. He said, it's not a super speedway. It's not a big, big race track. He says, it's a big short track is all it is. He said, if you do everything you do on a, an inch big short track, you'd be successful there. And I think he's right. In many ways, pole sitter Bobby Varon epitomizes where Dirt Motorsports is today. As we document the changing of the guard, this 28-year-old shocked the field Wednesday when he stole the pole for the world's richest race on dirt. These days, it's a long journey to the top of dirt racing. Bobby Barron has paid his dues and is on his way. Nothing worth savoring ever comes easy. Bobby has had to drive several cars this year, but has come away with two big wins. And coming to Syracuse is ninth in Skull Points. Bobby Barron is an exciting driver with a promising future. Last year's 12th place finish at Syracuse proves he can compete at the Moody Mile. But for him to succeed, he must concentrate on what he must do. Syracuse is intimidating. Uh, there's a lot of good quality teams, and they all go there with the very best of equipment. Uh, each chassis manufacturer, Troy or Olson, Bicknell, uh, Tobias, uh, whoever it may be, goes there with their, their best of their best, and, and they have four or five cars that are regular deals, and then they have four or five cars that are on special deals where they're trying some new stuff. So so there's a lot of intimidation factors as to who's going to have the fastest car or whatever. So you need to really keep focused and, and keep a perspective on what your own team is doing so that you can just take it step by step to improve your own team so that you can be the best that you can be. Bobby Varon, you have got to be majorly jazzed about starting this race on the front row today. Oh, it's a great feeling. We're very happy. We're very pleased with the performance of this Harold trucking car. Going to the first turn first, I'm sure it's going to be a priority, but then you've got the rest of the race to worry about. Yeah, we have to be here at the end if we want to win the race, and, and we're concentrating on uh, keeping the car nice and clean, nice and smooth, and uh, be there at the end. Bobby Varon is essentially the rabbit being chased by a bunch of greyhounds further back in the field. Andy Fusco's got one of the fastest dogs in the place. And Paul, this dog will hunt. 
Dave Blaney has one of the fastest cars in the field, although he starts way back in 26th position. He missed time trials. That's why he starts back in here. He had practice down at Homestead and Bush Grand Nationals. Dave Blaney, you've climbed a lot of mountains in your career. What brings you back to Syracuse? Well, I just enjoy racing here. Uh, I enjoy running this race. Uh, uh, you know, I have a lot of fun with Brian Goey and Bobby Hearn, and, and uh, we'll just run hard and see what we can get. We've got a plenty good enough car to get there. Uh, we'll just see what happens. Bush Grand National rookie, former outlaw champion. You finished third in this race three times. What would winning it mean to you? Well, you know, you come into every race wanting to win it. Uh, it's definitely a big race that I've never won. And, and you know, I can't say I've got a lot of experience in these cars. These guys are awful good, and they're awful good at long-distance races. So we're just uh, hoping we can have a shot at it, uh, you know, we get down to the end of it. He may be starting 26, but look for him to be a factor in the front before it's over. They don't call him the Buckeye Bullet for nothing, Doug, and uh, we're going to see the Buckeye Bullet charging from the number four spot today. When we come back, we will start the engines. Things will roar to life here at the Moody Mile. It's the Eckert 300, and we are live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. Doug Logan along with Gary Montgomery back at the New York State Fairgrounds. This is the world's richest race on dirt. The culmination of the 98 racing season. It's Super Dirt Week and the Eckerd 300. And we have a huge throng on hand. Let's take a look at our race analysis. 188 laps, 300 kilometers. The purse upwards to $400,000. And the winner's share will be in the vicinity of $100,000. The weather, well, things are mild here in central New York. Temperature 59 degrees, no threat of rain. No Track rain, that's the good news. It's a one-mile clay oval, legitimate one mile. That uh, was alluded to earlier. This is a horse race track, or was, so it is a one mile. Straight away is 1,500 feet. There's no banking any place around the racetrack, other than getting on pit road. As for our track condition, let's go down to Cowboy Paul Small. Well, guys, when you call this a dirt track, you're not kidding. This sucker is hard. It is slick. There's a ton of rubber that's been built up on this racing surface without a lot of heat today. Tires probably won't be an issue. This track probably won't get abrasive. But not everything at Syracuse today is as it seems. Let's go to Andy. Indeed, it's not, Paul. This is not Brett Hearn's car. It's Brett Hearn's backup car. Jerry Higby will drive it from the fourth starting spot. He time trialed the Goey car, earned the fourth spot, gets to keep his starting spot. Brett Hearn, one of the things you've got to do today is beat a teammate. How'd that come about? Well, you know, Jerry Higby works for my brother Bobby and builds ETO Pro Cars out of his shop. And it's uh, sort of an agreement that we made uh, at lunchtime one day that if he had gotten in the top six with that four car, he was going to qualify that for Blaney in the first day of qualifying. If he got in the top six and he wanted to run my backup car, I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Never thought it would happen, but it's not so bad having a teammate. Not so bad indeed. Back to you, Paul. We have the most famous words in racing, courtesy of a whole bunch of friends from Eckerd. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. The engines roar to life here at the New York State Fairgrounds. Flying 300 kilometers into the future. Black and white checkered flags. Who will become the latest dirt motorsports racing legend? Well, there are 46 drivers in the field, and all 46 of them thinks he has a chance of winning. That's why they're here. They never give up. The official pace car of the Skoll Series is sponsored by Bombard Chevrolet, located in Skinny Atlas, New York. Bombard Chevy, not an auto mall, just a dealership in the country. Let's take a look at the starting grid for the Eckerd 300. Row one, 
First pull, fifth start. He sold cows to buy his first race car, Bobby Barron. And outside, the 91 of the man of the year thus far, Billy Decker. Starting third will be Jeff Tromley, and alongside is Jerry Higby. You heard his story. He's in car number 3-8 today. Row three, poised for victory. The 115 of Kenny Tremont and the 56 of Red Hot Pat Ward. Bay State driver Dickie Larkin out of Sheffield, Massachusetts, shares row four with the Hurricane Steve Payne. On to row five, Eddie Marshall drives the number 98, and we just spoke with five-time winner number three, Brent Hearn. A guy we talked to earlier, Jimmy Horton, the two-time champion of this race, inside of the sixth row, second-generation driver Ron Smoker starts 12. On to row seven, it's Craig Von Doren and the 1X of Todd Stone. One of our five rookies in the field today, Bobby Hayes Jr. Pete Bicknell, who won here yesterday, starts at position 16. Row nine, the brothers, number 24, Alan Johnson, two-time winner and the six of defending race champion Danny Johnson. Row 10 is all New Jersey, but Chrisman and Jimmy Chester. On to row 11, it's Tim Dwyer and Frank Cozy. The Fonda and Granby track champion David Kamara inside of the 12th row. Rookie Chuck Bauer is in position 24. On to row 13, the 32C of Vic Coffey and the 4B of three-time race runner-up Dave Blaney. Second generation driver Donnie Corrales out of Rensselaer shares the 14th row with Chris Moore in the Rick and Corky thumb car today. On to row 15, Pierre Hebert and the 19 of our 1988 race winner, Kenny Brightville. On the inside of the 16th row, driving the Jolly Time Popcorn Special is Mike Petruska out of Wayne, New Jersey. Veteran driver Butch Tittle is outside. On to row 17, the 84, watch Gary Tompkins. And the number eight of Jack Cottrell. Orange County Fair Speedway track champion Chuck McKee shares this 18th row with Rochester, New York driver Gil Tech Jr. He won this race in 96, starting inside row 19, the 1H of Doug Hoffman. And outside, hard-charging Tim Fuller. A family affair is row number 20. Bob McCready, a former champion of this race, is on the inside. His young son starts in position number 40. On to row 21, it's Stevie Botcher and Jamie Mills. Mike Benson, who won the non-qualifiers race just a few moments ago, and Scott Prentice make up row number 22. And row 23, Randy Sherlock, and the 12B of a two-time winner. He's run 26 of the 27 Syracuse events. Jumping Jack Johnson. Now the cars veer off the racing surface and down pit road. Yeah, this is uh, in theory to acquaint them where their pit stalls are. Now. Pit road here at Syracuse is a real problem. It simply isn't big enough. These guys will be not traveling at this speed the next time you see them on pit road. I can guarantee you that. Well, we have some very uh, familiar faces, but not necessarily familiar winners up front. Lots of new faces. In fact, the first nine starters today have never won this race, and I think that is incredible. It certainly is, and the fact that uh, Brett Hearn starts in position number 10, he's the winningest driver here. He's won it on five different occasions. He's got to pass uh, all those guys in front of him. Pit strategy will be a big deal here today. Yeah, it really is a major factor in this race. It is. Uh, for those that watched the program yesterday, they know that it was the outcome of the race was determined in the pits. Uh, very likely could be the same thing today. And here's where the professionals and the experience will come into play. Now, what is going through the minds of these race drivers as they tour this oval? It's interesting. Bobby Barron, in his uh, sit-down story, said it was an intimidating place. And when Paul's, Paul talked to him live, he seemed as cool as a cucumber. Uh, you can rest assured that uh, he's a nervous cat right now in that uh, Herald Trucking 35. Let's check a look at the in-car cameras. We'll be bringing you the action here today. And there's a look out of the back of Brett Hearn's Budweiser corporate jet, the car number three, starting in position number 10. And here's a shot from Billy Decker's Adam Ross, Randy Ross owned bug chaser number 91, going from the outside of the number one row. And a little wave from Billy Decker, what a sensational story Billy Decker has been in 1998. Incredible. Uh, 
not really a full-time racer, but uh, he's involved with his family business, the quality hardwood, so he's the general manager of that operation. Gets a lot of time off when he wants to race, and uh, he wants to race a lot. He's the winningest driver in Dirt Motorsports' big block competition this year. He won the track championships at all three of his weekly race places, the uh, Friday night race place here in Brewerton. He won Canadigua on Saturday, the championship there, and he won the Weed Sport Championship as well. So Decker having a banner year. Another huge crowd in this incredible grandstand here at the New York State Fairgrounds. Congratulations, Dirt Motorsports President Glenn Donnelly. He's put it together once again, recently honored by the Chamber of Commerce here in Syracuse for this event annually, pumping $11 million into the local economy. And we're looking to pump about $100,000 into our race winner's pocket here about uh, two hours or two and a half hours from now. These guys normally race for the neighborhood of $2,000. So to race for $100,000, it pumps them up a whole bunch. The field now in turn three, paced by Bobby Varon. Big block Chevrolets for the most part. Dirt rules say the 467 is the maximum cubic inch displacement. One four barrel car, but the cars weigh 2,550 pounds. The pace car pulls into the pits. Bobby Barron fires out of turn four. The green flag is out, and the Eckert 300 is on. And Barron grabs the lead. Billy Decker settles in second as the field heads into turn one. And Jerry Higby Jr. getting out of shape early in the other Budweiser car. He falls back now. One spot, he runs in position number five, but he's about to go to six as Pat Ward will make the pass down the back straight away. So Pat Ward comes to five, and Higby falls to six. The leader is Varon, but he's got pressure from the bug chaser, Billy Decker. The field safely through the back stretch. Now turn four. Here comes Varon, and one lap about to be in the books. Bobby Varon is a race leader with Billy Decker second, Kenny Tremont third. And here's a shot from uh, Decker's car as he looks to the inside of Varon, but Varon has, well, he's not, he, Decker, isn't able to challenge right now. He runs about two or three car lengths back, but you can see how loose Varon's car here is, is here in the early going. That could be a problem later on. There's Steve Payne going up to the outside in the bright yellow car as he is wrestling with Brad Hearn for position. Here's Jimmy Horton in the black number M1 making a move on the outside. There you see the third place car, the 115 of Kenny Tremont. Early stages of the Eckert 300, and Bobby Barron, who has been fast all week, continues to show that speed here at the Moody Mile. Clint Harrell is the car owner, and that uh, oh, Harrell won this race back in 1992 with Richard Tobias Jr. as his driver. And prior to that, they had uh, the, the track record here for a number of years with Glenn Fitzcharles. So Harrells have some very good equipment. They've got a new driver for the last couple of years, Bobby Barron. He's making the most of it right now. We begin to settle in just a little bit now. Three laps complete. Barron the leader. Decker right on his back bumper. Everybody very, very safe. Yeah, they're uh, being a little conservative. They know the only way to win here is to finish here. And there's the driver running on the outside. That's Horton. Remember, Horton hasn't won a race all summer long. And he hasn't won a slow race, as he told us in the interview earlier, for the past couple of years. So he's going to try to make some ground here, up some ground here in the early going. How has the track come along? Because the weather this week has been very volatile. Well, volatile indeed. <laughs> it's a whole lot better than it was yesterday, Doug, for sure, when it was uh, wet. It's certainly dry today. A lot of rubber on it, and as Paul said, it's very, very hard. But no sun, and that's going to be a factor as the day progresses. Here we see his shot of Dave Blaney working the outside. He's in position number 16 now, so he's already passed 10 cars, Doug. The Buckeye bullet, that bright orange hood, the number four, the going team car, Dave Blaney uh, at the keyboard, and he's passed 10 cars, and there's somebody getting way out of shape behind him. We'll try to figure out who that was in just a moment. Uh, that's uh, Bobby Hayes Jr., the rookie. And, uh, he looked like a rookie right then, but he got away with it. You get out of that groove, and you have to hang on for dear life. Blaney is flying. The Buckeye Bullet. His dad didn't qualify for the race. His dad was here this weekend, but didn't qualify. Uh, Lou has been a regular here for since the beginning. We've got five laps down, but Lou didn't make the field today. He's uh, cheering his son on right now. Race leaders have flown away from the pack. Yeah, they've opened up nearly a full straightaway advantage. They, the leaders being Baron and Decker. Then running third is Tremont. Four is Pat Ward. Five, this guy's moving up a lane every six, time in turn one because he knows you're looking outside. Race communications with Dave Blaney. 
and he's got a lot to talk about right now. And they got a lot to tell him because he is mired in traffic as he picks up a spot as he moves by Ronnie Smoker down the back straightaway. There's Blaney on the inside. Again, the bright orange number four. Blaney, and you saw just a puff of tire smoke. That wasn't really a problem. So he moves to position number 15. 112 miles per hour in the last speed lap average for leader Bobby Barron. There's a shot of the defending track or the race champion Danny Johnson. He's in the red and white RJD trucks car trying to make a pass on the inside. Look at again Dave Blaney way out high. His car had quite a push in Friday's heat races. How does it look to you today? It looks uh, like uh, he's just trying to get to the front. I can't really tell right now uh, because he's just going wherever there's a clear lane. And the guy in front of him just a moment ago is Danny Johnson. And Danny is still in front as they move by. Now there's a change as uh, the Todd Stone car uh, gets passed by both Blaney and Danny Johnson. Here there are your leaders, Bobby Varon and Billy Decker. And uh, there's a little bit of smoke out of the rear end of Billy Decker's car. We'll keep an eye on that see it yeah I do I think it's just tire smoke I certainly hope for Decker's uh, team that it is tire smoke as the race leaders duel it out further back in the pack Dave Blaney now 13th and on be third. patient with him doing a real good job real good job be patient with him I think patient isn't one of his uh <laughs> operative words. That was the scanner of Billy Decker. Be patient with Bobby Varon. He's right there on his back bumper, and you don't want to do anything foolish this early in the race. You're right up front. There's Blaney in the floor. Blaney, Blaney has moved by Danny Johnson. That's very, very important. Moving by Danny Johnson, and he's up to the number 12 spot. The next car to fall, if he has his way, will be Eddie Marshall, the second generation driver out of Pound Ridge, New York, in the Marshall Oil number 98. back on the inside. Again, the lead car in that little combo is Marshall, the second generation driver. Jack Cottrell's car number eight goes up and smoke here on the front straightaway, and that brings out the caution flag. Yellow on the speedway, Jack Cottrell, the Kendall Oil car out of Rock City Falls, New York, blows an engine. Three strikes, you're out. So the day ends early for Jack Cottrell. And... Our spotter, Kevin Kovac, up here in the broadcast booth, points down to the front straightaway, and yes, fluid all over the front straightaway, so we are under yellow. And there's where the fluid came from, Jack Cottrell's car number eight. This is the Eckerd 300 from the New York State Fairgrounds in Syracuse, and our coverage will continue after this timeout, live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. Back under green at the New York State Fairgrounds, the Eckerd 300. We are 14 laps complete, and there are your race leaders, Bobby Varon and Billy Decker, but Kenny Tremont is trying to make a move inside. And Doug, on the restart, it was Brett Hearn picking up a couple of spots going by his teammate and going by Jeff Trombley as well, so Hearn went from 7th to 5th on the restart. Blaney picking up some positions as well. He's up to the number nine spot. Blaney in the number four runs in position nine, but here we have your leaders, and they're all freight training down the front straight away. Aaron Decker, Tremont, and Pat Ward, Jeff Trombley, Brett Hearn. Doug, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that that's not her. And I think that uh, it's the teammate car that got by him and probably got by as well. So someplace, we didn't see it, but her loss of ground someplace on the racetrack. Well, we'll take a look as they come by. Here they come down the front straightaway. Baron, Decker, Tremont, Ward, Trombley. Hearn. Then it is Hearn. Okay, Hearn. Well, then it's going to be a problem all day. The uh, red car, Budweiser car is looking uh, nearly identical. A little blue on the Higby car. And an A right up 
that three, but there's Dave Blaney. I there's, can't see the A. There's I might three see the blue. <laughs> and then there's four. And oh my, Blaney went high once again. He may have put white walls on Brian Goey's rocket ship, but uh, he got away with it. And there's a little tire smoke because he tries to run down. Now that's a Higby car directly in front of Blaney. And the story early in this race, further back in the pack, is Dave Blaney. Let's go down to the pits and Andy Fusco. I'm down here with Casey Goey. He's the crew chief on the Goey number four. What's the early strategy? You just go as hard as you can? Well, Dave said before the race, this is basically a 188-lap sprint race. So uh, our plan was get up front with the leaders and uh, and kind of hang with their strategy. Okay, you're already now in the lead pack. What is the, what is the strategy as far as pit stops from here on in? Well, we're going to stay a little flexible. We'd like to do gas only the first time, but uh, we're going to leave that open and see how Dave feels. The Coley car is a rocket ship, guys. And he's using the entire track. It certainly is. Now, he's got a little problem here. He is a sprint car champion and specialist. He knows how to go so fast for 25 or 30 laps. This year, he's making the transition to Bush Grand National Racing, where they run for two and 300 miles. So he's learning to pace himself. I think he forgot about pacing here, and he's back to his sprint car style as he tries to run by, and he does pass Jerry Higby Jr. for position number, I believe that'd be for the number six spot. Further back, you saw the black car, Jimmy Horton. He's passed both Danny Johnson uh, and uh, somebody else to pick up a spot. So he bumped Higby out of a ride, then he bumped him out of a position on the track. Oh, my. Now it's Brett Hearn as Higby fell back three spots. Blaney now running in the number seven spot, trying to run down the sixth place car of Hearn. Now this is a great duel here. One lead, Blaney. This is a One. great duel on the race course here. The scanner is with Brett Hearn, and the in-car camera is with Brett the Jet. We should establish, Brett mentioned it earlier, but uh, his car built by his brother Bobby and a car behind him built by his brother Bobby as well. These are the TO Pro cars, so there's a little family feud going on right now as uh, Bobby's uh, house car, the number four, trying to run down his brother's number three. The front straight away they come and it looks like these cars are getting some pretty good fight on this track you're right doug you they are and you can catch that on the camera on a number of occasions when they pick that uh, left front tire right up in the air and that means they're getting a whole lot of side One. bite and rear bite uh, it's pretty it's fast and it uh, gets the job done but it's a little rough on the equipment in fact it's a lot rough on the equipment last lap turned in by leader bobby Barron, over 115 miles an hour incredible that means they're going up over 130, probably over 135 down the straightaways. They scrub up a lot of speed in the corners here at Syracuse. There are the top five. On, there right there, right there. Right there. Board, Jeff, probably there we see a pass for the position number six, and there he goes. So Dave Blaney passes Brett Hurd for position. Well, what can you say? Early race performance of Dave Blaney. What you can say is he, I hope for his sake, he doesn't wear it out too quickly. The car doesn't appear to be handling absolutely perfectly, but that could be because he's just roughhousing it and trying to get it to the front in such a hurry. Jeff Cromley is the next car in line. One lead, Horton, one. And it's uh, certainly not, it being uh, the four, Blaney's car is certainly not straight all the way around, but again, he's horsing it, coming from 26 to six. There you see it. Jeff Trombley in the 21. Dave Blaney in the four. Now our race leaders, Bobby Varon and Billy Decker, have pulled out. Oh, boy, high for Blaney. Yeah, now again, we're, we're just talking about it. I don't know if it's handling or if he's horsing it too much. I don't know, but it's cost him some ground, and it may even cost him a position as Hearn is there. Brett Hearn does not want to be outdone. He's digging down low, but look at the bite there by Blaney. Hey, let's go down to Cowboy Paul Small for the latest. Well, you're talking about whether Blaney is horsing it or whether the car is not handling. Gary, I'm going to go with your assessment that he's horsing it, and I'll tell you why. He is driving this car harder into the corners than anybody else. Most everybody is letting off. You can see the car kind of settle down. The actual chassis dropped down a little bit. But when he goes into the corners, that's not happening because he's rolling out of the throttle, throttle a lot more gradually as he comes into the corners. You can see now as he works his way into the corner, he's kind of maybe what we call a diamond. 
straight into turn three, turning the car a little bit, then trying to run straight off turn number four. The key point to this, he's going in a motor, he can make passes going in a lot easier than he can anywhere else. We just had a lead change. Yeah, Bobby Barron. Bobby Barron way high, and he's really struggling with that car. He went and way high to lose the spot, then he almost hit the inside wall on the uh, recovery. And Billy Decker has taken over the lead of the Eckert 300 here in Syracuse. We're on lap number 26, and we have a new leader, the second leader of this event. Billy Decker started the number two spot, wrestles the lead away from Bobby Barron. And they are in heavy traffic right there. You see the shot. Decker, the third car in that particular line, trying to put Pierre Hebert down a lap with Hebert in the number 71. There's a shot from the bug chaser in-car camera. Again, the car in front is Pierre Hebert. Another car slowing, and they may both move by him. Chris Moore is on pit road with a thumb car, number 12T. There's a flat tire on Scotty Prentice's car. Scott Prentice, who made the race this earlier today, oh my. second in the non-qualifiers race, blows a tire. And a couple of folks had to play dodgeball there. They all dodged as the uh, operative were there, and there is no caution showing yet. And Prentice will be able to clear, or so it appears, and we'll stay under green. He is able to milk that car into the pits, and so we do indeed remain green here in Syracuse. And we're inside the car of the race leader, the number 91 of Billy Decker. Track champion at Brewerton, track champion at Cuga County, track champion at Canandaigua in 1998. He won the uh, Fourth of July race here on the mile. He won down in Delaware. He won the school race at Canandaigua as well. We've said it a number of times, but it's worth repeating. It's been a breakthrough year for Billy Decker, his car owner, Randy Ross, a great, great team, and uh, they're having a great year. We, uh, They're great people. We're happy for them. There's Dave Blaney in the number four as he continues to uh, look to move up. We talked about horsing it or whatever the problem, handling whatever that problem may be. And of course, we're just guessing at all that. But another thing that I don't think I'm guessing, I am guessing, but I'm sure I'm right, is in all that, he is wearing out the tires. And there he may be wearing out the race car as he moves by Tromley, picks up a spot. Oh, opened up the door with reckless abandon, the young man from Hartford, Ohio. That got physical. <laughs> No patience, indeed. He, again, he's got his World of Outlaw sprint car mentality working for him here today. We should establish he was on the pole for the Bush Grand National board. race at Charlotte just a week ago. And we're under yellow. The yellow flag is out. Car on the wall in turn two. That'll be Todd Stone, the young driver out of Middlebury, Vermont. Uh, parks the Gardner Stone Motorsports number X1 up against the wall. Apparently no damage there as he fires it up now and will pull away. He was the rookie of the race here last year. Handsome young redheaded fella out of Vermont. Billy Decker is the leader of the Eckerd 300, and we're coming up on lap 32 complete here at the New York State Fairgrounds. Our coverage of the world's richest race on dirt will continue after this. We are live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. the New York State Fairgrounds in Syracuse. Super Dirt Week 27 and the Eckerd 300. And we've already had our first pit stop of the afternoon. And it's the number four of Dave Blaney. Let's get the latest from Andy Fusco. Okay, here's the story in the Blaney pit. The right rear tire showing excessive wear. A lot of tread on it, but it was cupping tremendously and very, very hot. They changed the left rear as well. They've gotten the right rear all the way inside the hauler so no one can see it. This one's the left rear. These guys, know, don't everybody in this pit is watching the jumbotrons right now. They don't want to give anything away. But believe me, the cupping on the right rear is significant enough that these guys are scared. They got a fast hot rod, but it's burning up tires. I'm not sure it's the hot rod or the hot rod driver that's burning up the tires because, uh, well, we talked about it uh, all race long. So anyway, we'll get to watch him come from the back. He started 26th on the start. He'll go to the back now. Alan Johnson and Jack Johnson, other drivers making pit stops here. We are inside the window. We're in lap number 34 now. They pitted on lap 33. So this is a legitimate stop that counts towards the two that they have to make. This is the uh, bumping incident between... Uh, the number four of Dave 
Blaney in the 21 of Jeff Tromley. Very physical move as he got all the Blaney got all the way up to the fifth spot on our grid and now has to fight from the rear. Let's go down to Cowboy Paul Small. Leader Billy Decker did not come into the pit area on that first yellow flag at the first opportunity. Now their crew is thinking about changing two sets of tires in their preliminary strategy. So Billy may not be worried about burning up a set. But apparently he hasn't burned up a set yet. And he's not worried about fuel mileage yet at this point. They're coming off four. We're going back to green. The leaders have looked very, very smooth. We're talking about Barron except for one bobble. And Billy Decker, uh, Blaney looked fast, but not necessarily overly smooth. And way, way high is one of the three cars. It's the 3A of Jerry Higby. And Blaney has already passed about seven or eight cars in a bonsai move. Now, some of those cars are on pit road uh, that is in front of behind him now, but I think he passed seven or eight here on the first lap. There's Danny Johnson getting physical. He's uh, struggling uh, a bit, running back in the number eight spot. There's a shot of Danny in the RJD Trucks car number six, the defending champion of the Eckert 300. 37 cars remain on the lead lap. We're out the rear of Brett Hearn looking at Jeff Trombley battling the wheel just a bit. Burn, six-time Skull champion, four-time Mr. Dirt, five-time Eckert 300 champion. Wants to put another one to his credit here today. He's currently running fifth. The Budweiser number three, fifth in the field. Decker, then it's Barron, Tremont, Hat Ward, and Brett Hearn, the top five. Hearn runs in fifth, but rest assured he realizes that he may not have the fastest car here today, and that's not the familiar situation for the corporate jet. Uh, clearly in the early going, Blaney either faster or just dared to drive it faster, whatever, but Hearn not used to being passed uh, that early in the race, and uh, Blaney, there you see a shot of him. You want to keep your eyes, ladies and gentlemen, on that bright orange hood, because it's going to be a bullet. It kind of looks like a bullet, and it's the, the Buckeye bullet out of Hartford, Ohio, the second-generation driver, really tearing up the track. He goes by Craig Van Doren in car number 1514. Just moments ago, got by Bob McCready. And if you move by Bob McCready, you probably move by his son as well, and that is, in fact, the case. Boy, somebody getting out of shape directly in front of him, and there's Bob McCready trying to follow Blaney, and that didn't work. Mike Petruska in the Jolly Time Popcorn, car number 673, was the last car to fall to Blaney. Let's get the uh, latest on the Dave Blaney situation from the pits and Andy Fusco. Thanks, Doug. Here's the story down here. Blaney tells his crew the reason the tires are burning up on the car is because the car's too tight. He's got to literally horse it through the corners, exactly what Gary's been talking about earlier. To loosen the car up, they increase the stagger during the last tire change. And as you can see right there, Dave Blaney is pedal to the metal. He's going right back to the front again. He, 25th. Loosened, he loosened up Timmy Dwyer a bunch. The Dwyer, car number 1A, getting way, way out of shape after Blaney blasted by him. Donnie Carellis, a second-generation driver out of Rensselaer, will be the next to fall if Blaney has his way. 40 laps are complete as we work lap number, yeah, we lap work number 40. We've got 188 that'll make up the 300 kilometers here today. Field moving out of turn four. And down the front straight away. We should establish that there's no change up front. Billy Decker is the leader. He has about a 10-car length advantage over Bobby Varon. About three lengths behind Varon is the 115 of Tremont, runner-up here yesterday. Pat Ward running his very, very consistent race in the number four spot. Hearn is in five as we come down to complete lap number 43. And Blaney having his hands full with Pirellis. We told you the top five will go back a little further. Running six is Jeff Tromley. Seven is Jimmy Horton having a good run. Danny Johnson is in the number eight spot. As we laps click away, and Blaney continues his charge from the rear. There are your leaders. Tremont putting some pressure on Bobby Varon for that battle for second place. Tremont is there. But a headier driver out here, I don't think there's anybody cooler than Kenny Tremont. 
a family operation. He's got to bring it home. Money is important, and the only way to earn money is to be here at the end. He's never won this race. He's won the small block race on four occasions. Almost won it yesterday. Did come home in second. He was happy with that. Brought the car home in one piece. He'd like to have won, but he was okay with second. Scott Prentice out of the race in the 47. He had the tire shred earlier. Varen is holding off Tremont. Yeah, it would appear that Tremont is faster than Varen right now. And while this is going on, you can see that Billy Decker is able to stretch out his advantage even a little further as they race down the back straightaway. Allen and Jack Johnson pitted at the same time as Blaney did, and they are uh, running about a full straightaway behind him now. So Blaney definitely blistering his way back through traffic here and hoping that he's not blistering a tire in the process. So the Chase E is the Bud Chaser. The leader of the Eckert 300 is the 91 of Billy Decker. And our coverage, the world's richest race on dirt, will continue. We are live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. Live Under yellow at the New York State Fairgrounds, line. and Here we have strategy. a major Get crash in turn yep. three. Major crash indeed. At least four cars involved in the altercation. Bobby Hayes Jr., one of the cars involved. Alan Johnson was involved. I believe he has pulled away. Jack Johnson was involved as well. Craig Van Dorn's 114. There's Alan Johnson. He did not pull away the black car on the bottom. Doug Hoffman, the sweetener plus car number one. What a tough, tough break for Hoffman. He's one of the cars involved. Let's take a look at the replay and see how this all came about. Cars into the wall. Hoffman and Hayes. And then the chain reaction. Oh, my. That's young Donnie Corellis. And there's Bob McCready. Oh, what a lucky, lucky move for Bob McCready. Not nearly so lucky. Uh, the next car in. And oh, my. There's Alan Johnson doing a high-speed uh, pirouette. And it was uh, Jamie Mills crashing in so hard there in the white car, the last car in. And Jack Johnson up on the top of the screen, but he did not make significant contact. Another look at the tail end of the incident. This is going to be an awful look here. Petruska's pop, Jolly Time popcorn car sits, uh, well, they, the violent crash was behind that. Uh, you saw the uh, car come sliding in. Looked like Hayes may have gotten the worst of it from a contact standpoint, but we may have a number of cars out of the race as a result of this. We'll track it for you as we go into the pits. car that uh, we saw in the pits and uh, now we're going to have some pit stops there are our leaders on pit road good job here decker and Varen. let's first go down to andy fusco in the decker pit okay here comes billy decker in the buck chaser number 91 he hits the sign that marks the end of his pits this will be a two tire stop off comes the left rear off comes the right rear now the right rear back on they've changed the left rear the first can of Sunoco can two gasoline and the second can of Sunoco gasoline now going in. The left rear back on, the right rear is on, and Decker is away. Go, go, go. Over to Paul Small. Down here in Bobby Barron's pit, they were spilling a little bit of fuel out of the front of the nozzle of the second can of gas that they put in, so I'm not sure they've gotten a full tank in this car. A little complication right now on putting that left rear Hoosier racing tire on. Barron is down and away. Oh, Todd Stone trying to come out with the 1X, almost makes contact with Barron, and that's going to slow Danny Johnson down as he comes through on pit road. Also down on this end, Jimmy Horton making a pit stop with the M1, but he is late getting out, as is Kenny Tremont. They are all coming out behind the rest of the crew that was up in Andy's end of the pits, up towards turn number four. They got to their service first. They got down to the racetrack first. Always the most anxious times in all the motorsport, whether it be here or on Winston Cup Racing or whatever, the most violent 20 seconds in the sport, those pit stops, they're always hair racing here at Syracuse. It wasn't so bad on that particular exchange. Now, Varen got out of the pits before Danny Johnson, but on the exit going out, Danny Johnson appeared to pass Varen. Let's see exactly what happens with the alignment of these race cars as we get set to go back to green. Still clean up 
in turn three. And I know we're going to show you that incident one more time before we go back to green. Tough break for Doug Hoffman. We talked at the top of the show how he's had not had a great year. In fact, only two wins all summer long in big block competition. A new team for this weekend, well, for all summer. Carl Myers and Dan Coffey, the AC Speed World folks. And here we have a shot. Yeah, and Hayes and Hoffman are the first involved. And Hayes in the number four really, well, really gets tagged. It certainly does. And there's, there's McCready. Just a little love tap for McCready. McCready, very, very lucky. Look but out. Fresco with that new Jolly Time popcorn sponsorship popped right up out of the field. There's Alan Johnson almost missing. Does a 360, and uh, this car was damaged. It's Gilly Tag taking evasive action, going right off the racetrack, up onto the cinder track. To get by it all. There's Stevie Botcher weaving his way through. And look at Hayes' machine. The four-star transmission car. It was a winner at Orange County this summer. It's not going to be a winner oh. here today, and I don't know that it'll ever win again. The rear end is falling out and off of the Hayes machine. Uh, really quite a bit of contact there in turn three. When Jamie Mills, the number 30 that you see there, when he came charging into that car, that was a very, very vicious hit, and that's probably what tore the rear end loose. Let's go down to the pits and Andy Fusco. Thanks, Doug. Now, this is Billy Decker's right rear tire. It shows a lot of wear for only 50 green flag laps. First of all, it's cupped across the face. It's quite worn, and it's breaking up here on the outside edge, some blistering. Now, if you'll remember from last year's broadcast, the first time Decker pitted, he showed wear like this as well, but it kind of got along the rest of the race. The track came to him, so that bad tire wear on his first stop wasn't indicative of the rest of the day, so it remains to be seen whether this will be a problem. Paul? Right now. We're down here in Pat Ward's pit. Pat has elected to stay out on the racetrack right now. What's the strategy in keeping Pat out there? Well, right now, uh, our gas mileage isn't the best, so we're going to try and come in around lap 70 and uh, see what happens from there, change a couple tires, and hopefully we can keep going. Now, Pat usually runs the summer races without radio communication. Today, he has radio communication. Is that making this effort better or more difficult for Pat as a driver? Well, so far, it's doing pretty good. The car's feeling a little tight, but we're not bad, and uh, hopefully we can come in from there. You know, the plethora of racing communications, especially radio communications, started here at Syracuse Guys about 10 years ago with Bruce Silver and Racing Electronics. Nowadays, when you're running a long-distance race like this, you got to have that radio communication. It's very important, and I believe we've got a couple of more cars coming down pit road. Back up to you guys. All right, thank you very much, Cowboy. Right behind the pace car, the 56 then of Pat Ward. 51 laps documented here at the New York State Fairgrounds. Remember, the official supplier of Dirt Motorsports apparel is Bob Hilbert Sportswear. Production support for Rush Hour on Dirt is provided by Access Rentals in Syracuse and Albany, New York, one of the country's largest suppliers of aerial lifts. They extend every effort to get your job done professionally. Access Rentals. We are 52 laps in. It's the Eckert 300, and we're live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. Under green at the New York State Fairgrounds, Pat Ward is the leader of the Eckerd 300, and in second place is five-time winner Brett Hearn. There's a good news, bad news story there as far as Pat Ward is concerned. He's the race leader. That's the good news. The bad news is he's got Hearn chasing him down. He's got a radio. He'll find out about it. I don't know if he's smiling right now or holding his breath. Neither Ward or Hearn came into the pits. That's right. And as a result, they run one and two. Steve Payne is up to the number three spot. Pierre Hebert is in position number four. Bud Crispin runs in five. Frank Cozy is in six. And the Buckeye Bullet continues to charge. He's up to the number seven spot. Well, now we talked to Pat Ward's crew as to why he didn't, co didn't come in. Why do you suppose Hearn didn't come in? Good question. I don't really know, but perhaps he don't, fuel isn't a problem now. He obviously doesn't think his tire wear is a problem, so he'd rather he gave up all that and 
again, maybe didn't give up anything if everything was okay, but he now has favorable track conditions. Nobody in front of him except the race leader, a clean racetrack. He doesn't want to get in trouble early, and that can be crashes in the back of the pack. That could be the problem. That could be the strategy. Hearn pitted for the final time on lap 88 last year. He went the last 100 laps on one tank of fuel. Let's go down to the pits. Heavy, heavy damage to the Reifenberg construction number 57. Donnie Corellis, what happened out there? Uh, the Reifenberg 57 is running good. We're running by mid pack, and I saw about five cars ahead of me. Two cars get together and go straight to the outside wall and turn three. Ducked to the inside, and they slung shot back across in front of me with no place. I made the nose drill where you can see they got me right dead center of the car. Now, a couple of years ago, actually more like 15, your father had a horrendous crash here. Didn't Tommy Corellis ever warn you about turn three? <laughs> ah, not really. I don't think about it. About. We, you know, we got pictures of it hanging in the shop to remind us every day, though. <laughs> you guys talk about a change in the guard. This is one of the comers in coming years, Tommy Corellis. They'll have some new pictures to hang on the wall of the shop yeah. now. Here's a great battle right here. Bud Christman in the Brioski car trying to run down Steve Payne. That's the battle for the number three spot. And up to the number five position is car 4B Blaney. There it is. Again, the battle for the number three spot. Payne in the yellow three for 7X runs in three. The Brioski car. New Jersey driver Bud Christman. And the guy we've been talking about all day long, and I think we're going to talk about him some more before this thing goes to the checkered flag. That's Blaney in that bright orange and white Joey car number four. Changed a couple of tires in the rear, and it certainly it seemed to help the handling situation. Help the handling situation. Well, well and there he goes. <laughs> yeah, but but it, that's very important, Doug. It, it, he's got the freshest tires of any of these cars in front of him, and tires, uh, whether they're wearing well or not wearing at all, wearing out whatever the case may be new ones are better than old ones and he's got the newest ones of the bunch up front right now working on Bud Christman 60 laps of 188 now complete in Syracuse oh my he's making that big block modified look like a sprint car doing a great, great job with it. Very, very exciting run. Pat Ward is still our race leader. He holds about a 10-car advantage over Hearn, who's in second. Then in a different area code altogether is the third-place car of Steve Payne. A change, perhaps, for the number four spot. Yes, yes. Blaney, car four, slides by to take over the number four spot. Crispin shuffled back to five. So the charge continues. This is charge take two by Dave Blaney, almost all the way out to the wall there. From 26 to 5, then the pit stop puts him at the back, so virtually position number 40, and he's charged his way back to the number 4 spot with a little help from some pit stops there, uh, when some of the guys in front of him stopped, and he didn't have to do that, so... Blaney continues to charge, and he is all over the hurricane as they race down the front straightaway, and into turn number 1. And by Jack Johnson, who is lapped from that accident. Jack now goes two laps down. Boy, Blaney... Well, painting that rear bumper of the Hurricane. The Hurricane's got some body work that's come loose. The pillar post in the front of his big Dell car waving in the breeze. That's not slowing him down any, but boy, does he have a problem because Team Goey 4 is challenging, looking in the inside. Does he dare to do it? Mm, no, boy! <laughs> Great racing. Here we go. He can't make it work on the inside. He'll go to the outside. Oh, my goodness. Will it hold? Well, no. we have a yellow flag. We have a yellow flag just as Ward and Hearn. That's Higby. Jerry Higby Jr., the outstanding driver that uh, started in the number four spot. What a story he had going. But the uh, deal comes up short. Brett Hearn's backup car out of the race here on lap number 64. All right. This is just as uh, Ward and uh, Hearn had built up a straightaway lead. As uh, race leaders behind that battle for second between the Hurricane Steve Payne and the hard charging Dave Blaney. Now everyone will be packed back together. We're 64 laps in. And we want to remind everybody of uh, the reward that comes for leading lap 100. $10,000 from the nice and easy grocery shops for lap number 100. Blaney's in a good spot for that right now, but that's not what he's thinking about. He's thinking about the lap 188. 
Brett Hearn's crew is ready uh, for yeah, their stop, driver to come in and pit. Matt Ward's crew is also ready. So our leaders are going to pit right now. Here's the scanner on Brett Hearn. Here comes Ward. Here comes Hearn. We got you, man. Come on. Come on. Steve Payne, a third place, fourth place car is in as well. In the Hearn pit, here's Cowboy Paul Small. And Hearn rolls that car gently to a stop. And I tell you what, the outside of that right front tire is showing some pretty significant wear. One of the crew members is looking at it, holding the signal up to Hearn. They're working a rear tire change right now. The second can of gas is coming over. Now, unlike some of the other teams we've seen spilling a lot of fuel out of their cans, Hearn's getting a very clean entry with the uh, fuel cans into the race car. So you can be pretty much assured that he's getting a full tank. Hearn is down and away, further down Pitt Ward, Pitt, Pitt Road. Pat Ward looks to have a little bit of a problem getting the right rear on. We're watching it from our vantage point here from about 100 yards back, and they've got the right rear off, and they're working on something on the right rear of the Ward machine. So, guys, Ward is spending more time in the pits than I think he really wants to. Well, absolutely. Ward came in first, Hearn second, Payne third, Hearn out first, Payne second, and third, Pat Ward. Meanwhile, Dave Blaney is the race leader. Well, it's appropriate. We've been talking about him all race long, so he finally gets to, to lead a lap here uh, as we are under caution at lap 65. 65. Now, an interesting marriage here with the lap 100 prize and winning the race. No driver has won the $10,000 for leading lap 100 and went on to capture the, the checkered 000. flag of the Eckerd 300, and that award began in 1987. Although, in today's case, I don't know. I'm going to hold all bets. Yeah, this is not a betting what, man sport. What a ride for this guy, huh? Unbelievable. The team that came together here just the last couple of months, uh, Brian Goey, auto dealer in the Albany area, has a group of dealerships, and uh, he's always been involved in racing, always sponsoring race cars one way or another, and he puts together this team for Blaney and it's been a story so far, probably the story so far. The car that will actually take the green flag first is Tim Fuller. He will lead the field of the green. He's on the tail end of the lead lap. The top five are race leader Blaney. Bud Chrisman runs in second. Billy Decker is back up to third. Running four is Bobby Varon. Danny Johnson, the defending champion, is fifth. Pierre Hefer is sixth. Jeff Cromley is seventh. Jimmy Horton is eighth. Kenny Tremont is nine, and Eddie Marshall rounds out the top ten here as we go back to green on lap number 67. Meanwhile, Jack Johnson has just pulled off the racetrack and behind the wall, and the pace car off the front straightaway. Here we come. Dave Blaney is the leader of the Eckert 300. And again, that's Fuller, the lap car, trying to make up the lap. Chrisman runs in the number two spot. Alan Johnson, the lap car, showing in the screen as well. The black Mitsubishi car. Great sponsorship program there that Jim Beachy has put together for driver Alan Johnson. And they were hoping to win here today. They've got some folks over from Japan uh, watching the race, watching their Mitsubishi-sponsored car. But uh, he's a lap down. Can't count him out, but it's going to be tough. And you see Billy Decker, it's his 12th career 300 start, his best finish fifth in 94. He moves around the 22 of Gil Tate Jr., who's here with his Saturday night special. They didn't uh, fund a special car for Syracuse, qualified. They're happy about that. They're uh, going to try to ride it out. They're looking for that $10,000 win at half uh, way. That'll be a win for them. Leader, Blaney. Second, Christmas. Third, Billy Decker. Four is Bobby Barron, but he's got his hands full because the hard-charging, daring Dan, the stock car man, is right behind him. Danny running in position number five, trying to run down the red number 35. There you see him showing out of turn two and down the back straightaway. Trombley getting out of shape. He's on the outside of Allen Johnson now. So the Johnson, I'm sorry, that's the M1. That's a battle for position. That's uh, Jimmy Horton in the black number M1 uh, battling for the spot with Jeff Trombley in the white car number 21J. Down on the bottom was the red 35, the Clint Harrell, Harrell trucking car, the driver Bobby Barron. 70 laps are now complete. Again, this is a 188 lap contest, 300 kilometers. Down the back straightaway. Jimmy Horton is the guy that's darting in and out, trying to move around Trombley. 
Certainly having an outstanding run here this weekend. Nubik Nelkar for Trombley. The all-tier audio car. Hey, how's Bobby Barron hanging in there? He's doing a commendable job. He's fifth. Currently running fifth, our pole sitter, Bobby Barron, in the 35. Being hounded by Danny Johnson. No rear view mirrors in these cars, but they do have an advantage here. They are allowed radio communication, so they've got a spotter spotted someplace around the fairgrounds here, uh, telling Bobby where Danny is. Perhaps that's the deal. But uh, Varon has a problem with lap cars in front of him. And here we go a little further back in the pack as Jimmy Horton and Kenny Tremont are battling for position. And the third car in that little uh, deal is the 10th place running number 98 of Marshall. That's Stevie Botcher getting way out of shape up at the top of the green and white car number 31. He dives down to the bottom right behind Varon, directly in front of Danny Johnson. So some ancient moments there for Danny Johnson as the, the Botcher car, the Zeller Mobile car, coming from the top to the bottom, directly in front of Daring Dan. Oh, there's and a wheel off. Trombley, Jeff Trombley's car number 21J, running in the top 10 all day long, loses a right rear wheel, a left rear wheel, excuse me, on uh, the Altier auto car. We are just talking about him. The wheel rolling down the front straight away. There you see the wheel. That's our concern right now, making sure that nobody runs over uh, it. Broke the hub. Broke the hub. Yeah, they broke the hub indeed. Hang on, hang. The tire and wheel rolling now slowly and somewhat harmlessly. It's uh, not a factor for the grandstand. That's the good news. Uh, it's still bouncing its way down. And so Jeff Trombley, who started inside the second row, is in trouble on the front straightaway. Our coverage of the Eckert 300 will continue. We are live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. Back at the New York State Fairgrounds, it's the Eckerd 300, and the story of the day has been turned in by the driver of the number four, Dave Blaney, who is currently our race leader. From 26 to 5, a pit stop, put him in the back, and he's back in front. Let's go down to... Uh, Cowboy Paul Small, who's standing by with Jeff Trombley. Well, they just took the uh, left rear hub off of Jeff Trombley's number 21J here, and you can see the damage that is done to that corner of the car. Jeff is undoing his belts, taking his helmet off in the race car, so I would believe that Jeff Trombley's day is done. Jeff, that looked like that was a pretty wild ride out there. Hey, I'm actually lucky it broke just coming off the corner. If that was in the middle, we probably would have been in big trouble. Well, we're sorry to see you out, man. Yeah, that's the way it goes. Jeff Tromley's had some good luck and some bad luck. Unfortunately, today is going to be a bad luck day for him here on the mile. He was running with the leaders from the get-go. Here is a look right there out of turn four. He was wheel lucky to hold on. on. He was lucky to hold on to that car. Bad spot to lose a wheel. And we're lucky that wheel stayed on the racetrack. We'll set the field for you as we operate under caution. 77 laps will be complete when the field parades by this time. The leader is Blaney. Running second is Buck Christman. Third is the 91 of Decker. Four is Barron. Running in the number five spot, Stevie Botcher, car number 31. Sixth is car number six, Danny Johnson. Seven is Horton. Eight is Marshall in the 98. Running in the number nine spot, the 99 of uh, Dick Larkin. And rounding out the top ten, Vic Coffey in the Sweetener Plus, car number 32. Well, what's going on with the tires here for today's Eckerd 300? Let's go down to the pits and Andy Fusco. Well, Doug, tires and wheels are certainly a huge story here today at Syracuse. Now, consistent with that is this story. Yeah, it's a Hoosier tire, but guess what? It's not a racing tire. It's a street radio. Starting in 1999, the Hoosier company will be coming out with street tires for cars and trucks. We have one of the prototypes here. They tested this baby to 112 miles an hour, according to the spec sheet that I've got. Thank God they didn't do it in my town. But it's as uh, high performance as it is handsome. You'll be able to get these anywhere from a dealer next year. And, uh, oh, by the way, guys, could uh, you put this one in my car and see if you get three more like it. All right, Judge. Got to be careful. Green flag out. Crispin and Blaney battle for the lead. Blaney takes it into turn one. He hangs on. But Christman was feeling racy, looking up in the outside. It didn't work. The Brioski car falls into line now. The black car showing in the screen, a lap down. That's Alan Johnson. 
Then we have the yellow and uh, purple bug chaser of Decker. And they stream down the back straight away, pretty much single file darting in and out. There's my Bob McCready getting a little crossed up as he tries to run around Timmy Dwyer and uh, stay in front of Pete Bicknell. Bobby Barron in the 35. He currently right. runs fourth. He's running fourth and being pressured, as you can see, by the 31 of Botcher and the six of Danny Johnson. And directly in front is a lap car. That's Gil Take Jr. Botcher in the Zeller mobile car out of Lahighton, Pennsylvania. And man, his dad has run here in the past. Neither has won here, but they're always a factor. Bacha has a new sponsor for the weekend. Haynes and Kibblehouse have signed on for uh, this weekend. They've hurt two motors already. They're now running a big block that they borrowed from Bob Bowles, the car owner for Jimmy Horton. So some uh, sportsmanship going on there. Uh, some, I'm sure some money changed hands as well. Danny got him in four position. Of changing hands, that's spot changed as Danny gets by. And the lead is being extended to about two seconds. Blaney. Christman. Danny Johnson now running fifth. And there's a story. Brett Hearn, who pitted, has just moved by Tremont. I think Tremont was in, so Hearn has really uh, picked up some ground here. Questioned the strategy on that. Uh, he's in 22nd position, as a matter of fact, and uh, questioned that short interval between stops, but uh, whatever the strategy is, uh, it certainly isn't hurt. Nobody runs into the number 22 spot. Well, let's get the strategy. Down to Brent Hearn's pit and Andy Fusco. This is Dave Kwasniak. He's the crew chief on Hearn's number three. The first pit stop was for tires. What was the second stop for? Uh, we just brought it in to top the fuel off. Now, how do your tires look right now? Uh, we're pretty good right now. When do you figure you'll make your last pit stop? Uh, it's, that's Brent's call. It's tough to say right now. And, why, and, you know, obviously that would be around 100 laps or so. We just don't be able to get the last uh, the last run without a pit stop. How many stops would you make in between to tweak the car, try to get it right? Uh, probably three stops. There you are, guys. There we are. And we didn't learn a lot. It's Brett's call. Brett may have already made the call, but they're not going to announce it to all of us. Last lap turned in by our race leader, Dave Blaney. Nearly 117 miles an hour. That's the fastest lap of the race thus far. Somehow or other, I guess we shouldn't be surprised, Doug, because he's been uh, fast all race long. And when he doesn't have anybody in front of him, he can go a whole lot faster. He pitted on lap 33. We're talking about uh, Brett Hearn, of course, at stake today. The Eckerd 300 championship. He's gunning for a sixth. He needs to finish ninth to clinch the Skoll Series championship for 98. His adversary in that Skoll championship chase is Billy Decker, who runs just 73 points back in second. So the championship will go down to the wire here today for this. This is the last race in that series, but it's, uh, it'll be settled here this afternoon. We got to take a look at our race leader, Dave Blaney, and show you the interval now between Blaney and Crispin. First and second, because it is substantial. Dave Blaney now leads Crispin by six seconds. There's Blaney. And six seconds equates to a full straightaway and a little more here this afternoon. Blaney rips down the back straightaway. And look at that. All the way back to Christman. And Alan Johnson hanging tough. Again, he's a lap down. And the other car showing in that uh, shot was the... Uh, and we have some smoke coming yeah, out of the rear the, end of the one of the number three, three cars. Yeah. Uh, no, not one of the Only eight. one left. That's Hearn. And he's slow on the back straightaway. Is he in serious trouble? I don't know. Now he's back on the gas. So there's sheet metal damage. That's what it is. Somebody has run into him. And oh... Oh, the he's coming in with a left rear flat. Flat, left rear tire. You have to pull the body panel out. He's oh. gone flat. Brett Hearn has a left rear flat. And he's going very, very slowly. Five a real problem. Champion goes a lap down. He's a lap down. 
Yellow, 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 yellow. Oh, he gets a yellow flag. That'll help. That'll help, but it's uh, not going to bring that lap back. Brett trying to nurse that car into the pits. He was nursing it. Body for a that worked. Pretty good. You're going to need something to rip it out. Let's go down to Cowboy Paul Small. The left rear corner of the Hearn car chewed up a little bit by that tire exploding on the back of the Budweiser number three machine. They're taking that tire off. It is shredded right around the middle. And now they're having to do the old-fashioned elbow grease routine. They're taking out a hammer. They're trying to bang the uh, pieces of uh, bar that hold the bodywork out of this car away from the back of this left rear tire so that it doesn't cut into the tire again. As a matter of fact, it looks like there was contact to push that forward, and that's what caused the tire to go down. A quick top off of fuel. The Hearn car is down and away. He has lost an incredible amount of ground here, though. Yeah. Let's go to Andy Fusco for the up pit road. Andy? Okay, right now a big decision, a $10,000 decision for Dave Blaney. If he comes in right now around lap number 89, he's going to forfeit the $10,000 bonus doors. They pay that $10,000 bonus to lead lap 100. Also, another question, whether he could get 100 miles on a tank of fuel that's how many laps are left in the race, 100 miles. So right now, Blaney's making the call. Casey Goey, what are you guys going to do? Uh, we're going to come in, put tires on it, and uh, that should do us for the end of the race. There you are. He wants the win, not the $10,000. No mistakes. Paul? Slow stop. No mistakes. We're, we're further back up pit road here, and you can see Billy Decker's crew is ready as the field comes off. Turn number four. This will be Decker's second pit stop for the afternoon with the bug chaser machine. Now, here comes the Blaney car leading the charge into the pit area. So Blaney is up in his pit. Decker is about another 200 yards down pit road. He's coming in at a high rate of speed here. He's going to make the angle in just fine. They're going to go for a rear tire change again, and they're going to go for the fuel. So they went with the original strategy of changing two sets of rear tires during the course of this race. Several other teams up on pit road. Let's go back up and check on the Blaney situation with Andy. Okay, Blaney changed both right rear tires, but right now they're having trouble getting the right rear on. They're dragging the crew chief. The car's hooked up. The second can of gas, they had trouble getting that in as well. Now Goey's a, the Goey number four is on its way. The crew is very upset with their stop because they got they lost a lot of track time, but more importantly, did they get all of the second take of fuel in the car going 100 miles with less than a tank of fuel is almost an impossibility, guys. Well, Red Hearn making a return trip onto pit road. Same situation as the last time. They had everything from crowbars to sledgehammers out in this pit area, trying to bend that sheet metal and those bars away from that left rear tire. Back up to Andy. Okay, now there's confirmation that they didn't get a second tank fully into the car, so they're gonna bring Blaney back in right now. The going number four, the fastest car in the track, is going to have to come in not enough gas in there, Casey? Uh, we didn't get the second can in all the way. We had trouble getting it in. We're going to bring them back in and top it off. There's only three cars behind us, and uh, plus this will help us with our mileage a little bit towards the end. Does Dave seem discouraged with the way that pit stop went? No, not at all. Uh, we're going to be fine. If we'd lost a bunch of spots, it'd be a different story, but uh, we're going to be okay. Okay, the going number four comes back into the pit. Burns got another trip now on the Now they're getting the rest of the second tank of gas in there. It comes out the overflow. They're full up this time. 22 gallons for 98 miles. And, of course, Decker is ahead of Blaney on the track. As that for Brett Hearn, anyway. Brett Hearn is at least two laps down. A, a number of stops as uh, Paul has been Let's go, Dave. Hustle. We're going two laps down. Let's go. No driver has ever entered the Eckert 300 with a Skull Series point lead and lost the championship. It may happen here today. There was only a 78-point separation. Hearn back out of the pits in the number three. Brett needs to finish ninth place to uh, win that Skull Championship, and that is very much in jeopardy, one of the surrounding stories in today's race. And we're back to green. And the race leader is Bobby Barron. Running second is Danny Johnson. Third is Jimmy Horton. Fourth is Eddie Marshall. Rounding out the top five is Dickie Larkin. That's the result of the shuffling here under pit stop. Alan Johnson now has his lap back. He's showing at the head of the class. We got a crash, big time crash in turn at number two. Number of cars involved. Steve Payne is one of the cars involved in the uh, crash. Uh, like Jimmy Chester. Chester pulls away. the rest now this works beautifully for alan johnson oh bob mccready yeah, bob McCready's McCready's involved. involved oh my goodness 
Ronnie Smoker also involved. Major damage to Bob McCready's number nine. The steering wheel comes off. He's okay, but very, very upset, obviously. A multi-car tangle out of turn two. Ron Smoker's car still at the scene of the accident, as is that about there, Smoker now, refiring. The industrial tire car will pull away, but uh, extensive damage there. This as we near the midway point of our Eckerd 300. Well, Bob McCready was uh, not exactly challenging for the lead, but he was running a very strong race. Here this afternoon, here's the replay of the incident in turn two. Watch it now. Boy, big contact there, and Bob gets collected. I believe that was Vic Coffey down on the bottom, and that would be a tough break. He was running in the top ten. Coffey caught the berm on the inside, and that set up the whole chain reaction. Here's a situation where, rather innocently, the third car involved gets the worst of it. Looks like McGreedy got the worst of it there. Speeds are so, so high here, and when they crash, it's heavy. there's Bob walking uh, back to the ambulance. He'll take a ride, well, not to an ambulance, but to a command vehicle, all right. Right behind the pace car is the 35 of Bobby Varon. And he stands as the race leader, pole sitter, race leader, Danny Johnson second. Danny's in second. Marshall is in third. $1,000 to Bobby Varon from Dryden Oil for leading the midway point of the race. Next up, the prize for leading lap number 100. Pat Ward is back into the pits. Jimmy Horton in the pits as well. Kenny Brightville and Brett Hearn. And coming back out of the pits, Dave Blaney. So Blaney topping it off once again. Uh, nothing to lose for Blaney. He's running in the back anyway, so all these stops here not uh, hurting his uh, situation at all. Midway through the Eckerd 300, live from the New York State Fairgrounds, and we are on Rush Hour. Rush Hour. Super Dirt Week. Back to green of the New York State Fairgrounds. Leader Bobby Varon fires off turn four. He is the race leader here at the Eckerd 300. Danny Johnson runs second. Eddie Marshall is third. Pete Bicknell, yesterday's winner, is four. Vic Coffey apparently wasn't in that crash at all. He's in position number five. Six is early leader Billy Decker. Tremont is seven. Eight is David Camara. Chrisman runs nine. And Timmy Dwyer rounds out the top ten as we race lap number 97. Tremont working on Billy Decker, testing the outside. A little contact there in turn four and down the front straight away they come. And it looks like Tremont lost some ground there to Decker. Certainly did. A left car uh, separating the two as they race out of two and down the back straightaway. That's Pete Picknell's orange and white car that may be slowing on the end. That is, in fact, the case. So Pete Picknell, who won the race here yesterday, had a great run going. We just uh, told you he was in position number four, no longer. There's some damage, but uh, that's not the, the body damage isn't the problem. Apparently an engine problem for the St. Catharines Ontario driver, Pete Picknell, the wins extend, car number one. So the fourth place runner heads to the pits. We continue under green. The first cars in line that may be able to go the distance here are Tremont and Decker. And as you mentioned, Decker had just passed Tremont just before our last break there. And uh, so that's a very critical situation. Those guys can go the distance. Those in front of them will have to make one more stop. This is the race to $10,000. We have one lap to go. Barron leads Danny Johnson for the nice and easy grocery shops. $10,000 prize. Bobby Varen's racing career shifted into high gear when he put on a commanding performance at the Fonda Speedway, our first Rush Hour live show, Doug, a couple of years ago. And since then, it's all turned around for him. He's had some good car owners help him out. He's going to win $10,000 here right now. Down the front straightaway, the fireworks go off. $10,000 to Bobby Varen. 
I dare say that's the most he's ever won. As you said earlier, when he was 15 years old, he sold a few of his cows, I think four of them, to buy a street stock. And from then, it's been a racing farmer. He gave up farming. He's strictly a racer now. A little used car business on the side. But right now, $10,000 richer. And it's been really a, a tremendous week for Bobby Barron. Let's head down to Bobby's pits where Cowboy Paul Small is standing by. And I'm sure Bobby and the rest of the crew, you've got $10,000 in your pocket. Now you get to go for $10,000 and a little bit more at the end of the race. Are you good to go the distance? Yeah, we're good to go. We're going all the way. Has Bobby said anything about the car or the track? It's starting to break up in some spots. Uh, it's the same as we started. Perfect. Bobby Barron's crew says they are good to go. They're clean and green the rest of the way. Hopefully, they'll be right where they are in lap 188. Right where they are. I don't think you're to have uh, Danny Johnson quite that close behind him. There we have see a car slowing down. Well, not slowing. Maybe just uh, gathering it up. That's Timmy Dwyer and Alan Johnson blast by. Now, Alan is back in the lead lap, we believe. Bobby Barron's winnings this week now over $16,000. he's made in uh, a few racing seasons. Not this year he's won a few races. In the last couple years he's won a few, but uh, $16,000 uh, a lot of money. There's Blaney. Continuing to blast his way around the traffic. He's up to the number nine spot. Just doing precisely what he's done all day long. Charge. He's got a tough customer to charge by now, and that's Alan Johnson in a beautiful black Mitsubishi car. Timing and scoring the uh, official run down at lap number 100. Barron, the leader. Johnson, second. Marshall, third. Coffee, four. Decker, five. Fremont, six. Christmas, seven. Camara, eight. Wire, nine. We just saw him fall back. And Blaney at that time was running in the number 10 spot. Running 11 was the 99 of Bauer, the 31 of Botcher, and then the 19 of Tremont. They're all in the, or sorry, the 19 of Brightville, all in the same lead lap. Blaney very nearly got around Alan Johnson as he continues to charge around the Moody Mile here in Syracuse. Let's go down to Dave Blaney's pits with Andy Fusco. Well, whether Blaney can make it or not has been the uh, question in this pit for about the last 10 laps or so. As we all know, he came in three times for fuel, once, to once for tires as well, and twice to top off. And they've got a couple of calculators and a computer going here trying to figure out the mileage of the car. They actually measure how much they get in the car by how much is left in the gas can or the uh, overflow catch that as well so they can work that into the calculations and they just arrived at the conclusion that they think they can make it by about three or four laps so that they can go 192 laps of course the race is only 188 a lot of science and a lot of math went into the decision here down at this end of the pit i'm not so sure oh, no math there no me. math look out oh bad. dave blaney into the wall hard hard hit at high speed so all the calculations for fuel, the tires, it makes no difference. Blaney, a heavy, heavy hit. This is lap 106. We see movement in the cockpit. Right. Blaney hit the inside berm, That's then right. just veered to out to the year, wall. Did a good job, man. You right, and that's at the uh, beginning of the back stretch. You can see in the graphic, we're 107 laps in. And the man who's been a story. No longer a factor. For all the near misses that Blaney had to contend with, I mean, he was flying, and he this is precisely where he was uh, going out near the wall. He hit that inside berm, and then he was in a, he really was in a rocket ship right to the wall. <laughs> yeah, a rocket ship that was in the air, and uh, you can't steer it, you can't stop it, whatever. All right, watch this replay, and you'll see what we're talking about as he works on Alan Johnson. Now watch the front end get into that berm, then look out. We're going for a ride. Nothing he can do now. No. Didn't quite get all four wheels off the ground then, but they, well, at one time or another, they were all off. <laughs> I suspect so. Oh, tough break. The Buckeye bullet bites the bullet here this afternoon. There he is. Oh, what an impact. He's had a number of high-speed crashes this year, having crashed his Amico Winston Cup Pontiac on a few occasions. Well, let's see if he's out of the car. 
Meanwhile, we have another run on pit stops. Here comes Varon. Here comes Danny Johnson. Here comes Eddie Marshall as well. Vic Coffey running in the top five. He's on pit road. They can certainly go the distance from this point. And uh, first, Alan Johnson making a stop. Now, Alan has been really flying here. He nearly lost the lap. Uh, in fact, lost the lap, made it up, and uh, has been flying through traffic. Pat Ward into the pits. This, I presume, would be for a top off. There goes Barron out as Pat Ward pulls into his pits. In fact, they're going to make a tire change. And Barron is back out on the racetrack. He is the pole sitter. Danny Johnson is back. Botcher back on the speedway. Dick Coffey, uh, Billy Taylor directing the activities there today. Perhaps no surprise there that that's a good stop. Marshall is away, but Pat Ward is not having a good stop. Not at all. Alan Remain Johnson and Frank Cozy are away. Now remaining out on the track, Billy Decker. And Kenny Tremont. And Kenny Tremont. They try to establish the field as they parade by us here under yellow. Chuck Bauer's car has stalled on pit road, but they're pushing it. There you see the uh, hook treatment for the Team Goey rocket chip. Out of the race, lap number 107. All Ooh, right. They're going to roll it over on the record. Yeah, they've got some problems there they with do. the Dave Blaney machine, which is rendered useless for the remainder of the day. Our leader is the man who started outside the front row, the Franklin Flyer, Billy Decker. Our coverage of the Eckert 300 will continue from the New York State Fairgrounds live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. We are under yellow at the New York State Fairgrounds. Doug Logan along with Gary Montgomery. And the reason why, the crash involving the number four of Dave Blaney. And you want to see something that's pretty scary? Watch this. Watch the number four. And he couldn't steer it. Bounces off and bounces into the wall. That's the yellow flag. Well, catering provided to Dirt Motorsports by the Dinosaur Barbecue Restaurant, a honky-tonk rib joint located in downtown Syracuse. The Dinosaur serves up the absolute best in barbecue specialties, and you can get their unique sauces and funky apparel by calling toll-free their new catalog. Take home a piece of the action. The Dinosaur Barbecue, now open in Rochester as well. to go green back at the New York State Fairgrounds and the Camaro pace car pulls in and here we go back to racing leader Billy Decker third in the lineup now second and racing into turn one Kenny Tremont in the black and white car on the inside runs in the number two spot he gets by the lap car Bud Christman running third trying to get by the lap car and uh, David Camara is there as well Camara in the red number 26 runs in position four Dick Larkin in the black number 99 rounds out the top five as they stake their way down the back straightaway here at the Moody Mile about a one car length lead for Billy Decker right there Tremont and it looks like everyone as far as a pitch strategy standpoint, should be set to go the distance. There you see Steve Payne running in the number eight spot, but serious sheet metal damage on the side of car number seven X. The Todd Stone car number one X is against the wall. Now he was the car running at the head of the pack, and there's another crash. That's uh, Timmy McCready. Probably all the same crash, actually. McCready is parked between one and two. Stone at the exit of turn two, and the yellow is back out in Syracuse. And the leaders are right up front. Billy Decker and Kenny Tremont are right behind the pace car, and they will duel for the lead when we come back. 114 laps in the books here at Syracuse. This is the Eckerd 300 live on Rush Hour.
Rush Hour Super Dirt Week. Back in the New York State Fairgrounds, there's your race leader, Billy Decker. Well, he gave us a wild show all afternoon, then he went for a wild ride. Andy Fusco standing by with Dave Blaney. And Dave, was it as wild as it looked to the fans? Oh, yeah, I guess. Uh, man, that's a shame. I'd say Brian Goey and Bobby Hearn had a great car, and we, we were sitting right where we wanted to be. You know, made our last pit stop leading, and it didn't go right. And just trying too hard to make up ground while they were all bunched up, and just too many chances, and that's how we ended up. Your wrist, how hard is it? Oh, it's okay. Everything's okay. Just uh, hit hit pretty hard, and it, it hurts the car way more way more than me. I noticed that already when you uh, climbed out of the car and went and saw the uh, car owners, you guys were talking about next year. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's a long ways away. We've got a lot of racing between now and then. Dave Lane, you're pretty good spirits for uh, having kind of a sad ending. Well, we, we did all we could do. It just didn't work out. We'll come back. And we're back to green. Dave Farney has that green flag flying. Billy Decker gets the jump on Kenny Tremont. He's the leader. Bud Crispin is third. Doug, we have 17 cars in the lead lap, and the last of that group is the 56 of Pat Ward. So that uh, problem on pit road is cost Ward. He's in the lead lap, but he's in position number 17. And we've got 117 laps complete. There's the damage to the Hurricane Steve Payne. the front straightaway. The Mighty Mod Squad at work here. Working on the Moody Mile, and the mood of the mile has been pretty good. We even had a glimpse of sunshine for a moment. The sky's clearing up a little bit, but the sun has gone back behind some clouds. There's a shot of uh, paint down at the bottom. You can see the sheet metal has just been peeled away on the uh, 7X car. That's got to be slowing him down. Why they didn't make a stop in the caution, I don't understand that, but uh, I guess they didn't want to give up position there in position nine. And Danny Johnson right behind him and trying to run around. Danny Johnson testing Bobby Barron out high. Boy, it's tough to hang on out there. He did it, though. He made it stick. Scrambling down the back straightaway. 30 miles an hour, back off the gas and scrub off some speed through the corner and then back on it again and head down the front straightaway. It's amazing how much racing there is in this Eckerd 300, but we're not sure there'll be much more pit activity. I would say uh, no more pit activity, even if we have a yellow, you know, uh, maybe uh, he to come in and fix that <laughs> sheet metal. I certainly wish, certainly wish that he would. Here's Danny Johnson now, the defending champion, trying to move around the pole starter. Bobby Barron, as they race down the back straightaway, that would be for position number eight, I believe. We're on lap number 121 now. There's Danny in the number six, defending champion of this race. Just a career year last year. Viewers that turned in late, they're seeing the Budweiser number three uh, showing in the middle of that scramble. We're not talking about him because uh, he heard is down at least two laps. There we have a car slowing out of back straightaway. Is that uh, Brightville? One car up against the wall, Gil Tag. Takes against the wall, and we had a black car pulling out. Uh, Tag is, is both cars have moved off the track. So the black car was Jimmy Chester, so not uh, Brightville who's running in our uh, in the lead lap. Bobby Barron continues to hold the advantage on Danny Johnson. There's your race leader, Billy Decker. The 33-year-old jockey out of uh, Franklin, New York. His wife, Robin, is here. and Their daughters, Rachel and Kelsey, are here as well, cheering him on. And he runs at the head of the pack. Now, he has felt that he's had a couple of opportunities to win this race, and misfortune has struck everything thus far. And we're knocking on wood for him. Seems to be going smoothly. Gil Tank stayed out on the racetrack. Surprise there, and uh, he was obviously hoping for a yellow that didn't uh, occur, so he'll pull off on the back straightaway, I suspect. There's Chrisman in the blue and white with yellow trim. Brioski car, a little further back. Jimmy Horton racing with David Kamara for position. That would be for the number four spot. You know, 
know Jimmy Horton. It's been a it's been a long time since he's visited Victory Lane, but my, he's always in the hunt. He's always strong. Always in the hunt and uh, talked earlier. Bob and Michelle Faust have given him everything he needs to win. He just, for whatever reason, can't get the job, hasn't been able to get the job done. I talked to him earlier today and he wasn't smiling. Uh, he doesn't smile a lot. And I talked to him about that. He said, I'm smiling on the inside because I'm here and I'm racing and I love it. But uh, if he could win, I think we would actually see a legitimate smile on the White House. New Jersey driver, the sensational Jimmy Horton, working on Camara. Can he get him? Answer: Not yet. Now on the outside. Hey, what a move by Jimmy Horton! Power move around the outside. He's watching the lap counter. He knows that the leader Decker is running away. They got to stay in the same zip code, and uh, so he just couldn't wait any longer and takes a little risk, perhaps moving around the outside of Camara. The black number 19 of Sinking Springs, Pennsylvania driver Kenny Brightville. And now Bobby Barron will test Steve Payne into turn one, and he's got the position. Bobby Barron continues to be on the move, and Danny Johnson looks to follow suit. Danny thought about going around the outside. That didn't work. Thought about the inside. That didn't work. He'll try the outside as they race down the back straightaway. That probably won't work either. Maybe in the corner if he goes in deeper. He doesn't. He'll follow Payne into turn three. Give him a little love tap. Well, they don't have a rear view mirror. How's Payne going to know that somebody's back there? Right? <laughs> Got to nudge him. Six car lead on her. Six car. But he has not got Payne yet. Meanwhile, Barron is pulling away. In that battle for position now, Danny Clear. gets by Steve Payne. That's Charlie Green Green talking to Danny Johnson, Green and they're Connor. talking about Brett Hearn. Now, I they got to believe that they know that Hearn is a lap down, but uh, they know it. I'm not sure they want Danny to know it. That'll keep him uh, pumped up. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a rivalry. Danny Johnson now runs ninth. There's Brioski's entry, but Crispin. Milford, New Jersey driver. And so, a continuing success story here today. Let's go down to Andy Fusco. I'm with Jerry Brophy. He's the crew chief on the Brioski number 18. Your man Bud Crispin's in third place. Going pretty good. Yeah, we got a real good car today. Uh, I told him just to ride it out there in third and conserve fuel and tires and be there in the end. Be able to make it all the way from here. We pitted in the late 80s. We'll be okay. You pitted on lap 87. That means you got to go 101 laps. Nobody got any practice this week, or not a lot of it, because of the rain. What makes you think you can go 101 miles on a tank of fuel? Uh, we, we should be okay. It'll depend on yellows. You know, we're getting about a few miles. Is pretty good. I, you know, we, like I said, we didn't get much practice, so we didn't get a lot of time to check it. But we should be okay. I told him to conserve fuel best he can. They're banking on some yellow guys. They're going to need to have their fingers crossed. Well, this is Bud's third career start. Previous finishes in 96, 28th, and 22nd in 97. And we have cars slowing. We have a crash in turn three. The yellow is out. A pair of our top ten runners, Vic Coffey in the red and white number 32, and Stevie Botcher in the green and white 31. Two right in front outstanding of us, young right there, you drivers stop. having Steve heavy contact with the wall there. in turn number three. Both drivers are okay, but cars knocked out of the race. They were unofficially running in 12th and 13th at the time of the crash. So another incident in turn three. And we're under yellow with 131 laps complete here at the New York State Fairgrounds. Coffee fires his car up and backs away. The Sweetener Plus team came here with an arsenal of vehicles. Their drivers, Doug Hoffman and... Vic Coffey. There's your leader. Track champion at Brewerton, Canandaigua, and Cayuga County this year. Here we'll have another look, or a look, at uh, this crash. Oh, there's Alan Johnson. Uh, something must have broken on Botcher's car because he uh, changed lanes and uh, Coffey had no place to go. And you're right, Alan Johnson dodged another bullet. see Steve Payne slowing a little bit in front of that action? Yeah, and uh, that <laughs> I've been worried about that sheet metal. Maybe he's just slowing going to uh, make a pit stop. I don't know what's happening here, but uh, 
What we do know is that Botcher and Coffey are okay. Coffey, here's, he will continue the race. Uh, Botcher uh, certainly out of it. And uh, we should mention also that Coffey's car, he's running in the top ten. That car is built by Joe Plazek. It's that rocket ship that Plazek has had here for the past few years. The cantilever front suspension special for the Plazek Recyclers team. And here is the reason for that uh, slowing action. Right. There, the, the front right. The sheet metal had nothing to do with it, but the tire had all to do with it. And Hearns on pit road again. Again, he's down laps, not really a factor, and they're uh, in the car. There's a problem there. Well, Kenny Weld is one of the great names in uh, all of racing. Let's watch. 1998 marks the 25th anniversary of the start of the Weld era at Syracuse, a seven-year span in which the late Kenny Weld revolutionized modified racing not once, but twice. Kenny Weld was already a Midwest open-wheel hero when he moved east to run sprints in the late 1960s. But from his adopted Pennsylvania home, the Missouri native also became fascinated by the modified, or heavy as he called them. Weld's first modified revolution was this red, white, and blue number 29. He set fast time at Super Dirt Week 1973 and was running up front when the motor broke on race day. With its inboard front suspension, tubular chassis, wide aerodynamic body, and low rear center of gravity, the number 29 contained radical ideas that are still state-of-the-art in modified racing today. But for Kenny Weld, it was only the beginning, because in 1980, with that car, Kenny Weld broke the mold. The infamous Batmobile number 112, built by Weld and driven by Gary Ballou, turned Syracuse on its ear. The car set a track record that stood for more than a decade, and during the race, it was nearly two seconds a lap faster than anyone else. Ballou spent much of the afternoon driving one-handed while waving to ESPN cameras. The 112 had innovations which proved the genius of Kenny Weld. Things like ram air induction, an idea he'd come up with reading about World War II fighter planes and this roof, which was really just a sprint car wing in disguise. Kenny Weld had built the ultimate modified, and he was hated because of it. The 112 only raced once. It was immediately banned by the rule makers. Depressed by the fallout, Weld turned to drugs. He became an addict, then a trafficker, and finally, a convicted felon. After his release from prison, he tried an unsuccessful comeback. Incarceration had taken his best years. In 1995, Kenny Weld contracted cancer, and last year, the disease claimed his life. In his final interview, he said that his only hope was that he not just be remembered as a burned-out druggie. I'd like to think that Kenny Weld will get his wish. A great, great story put together by Andy Fusco and the late and great Kenny Weld. 134 laps complete here at the New York State Fairgrounds. Billy Decker leads. Kenny Tremont is second. Bud Chrisman is third. Dickie Larkin is fourth. And Jimmy Horton fifth. Dave Kamara, Kenny Brightbill, Bobby Barron, Danny Johnson, and Eddie Marshall. Your top ten after 133 laps. With Brett Hearn struggling for a top 20 position after blowing a tire earlier in the race and going laps down, Billy Decker is in current command of the Skull Championship. If he should hang on and uh, win this race, or if they stay in this similar position. 16 cars on the lead lap, 20 cars remain on the track, and the green flag flies once again from Dave Barney. Billy Decker loves this uh, situation. Clean racetrack in front of him. He's got nobody to race with. Just a three wide battle going on through the corner, and it'll be the 35 coming out okay, but not coming out so well as the 19 of Brightville. He lost several spots in that three-way battle. There's a shot of Frank Cozy. We haven't talked about Frank running in the top ten. Has almost uh, the last half, all of the last half of the race, and Sunday Moody's number 88. There's a shot of Danny trying to run around. Now, Danny's losing patience here. He runs back in position number seven. He gets eight. And uh, we've got uh, 50 laps to go. 52 laps to be exact. Horton in the M1. Danny Johnson in the freight liner number six. Horton's car is really rolling over there. But uh, you may like it that way. I'm not sure. That's a little tough on tires. Should 
uh, established that they're chasing the red and yellow number 26 of Pultley, Vermont driver David Camara. He won track championships this year at Fonda and Granby. Won a bunch of feature races in the process. And the other thing we should establish is that Alan Johnson is still very much a factor in this race, having lost the lap, made it up, and runs in position number 10, I believe, at the present time. So Johnson boys both running in the top 10 here as we approach the final portions of the Eckert 300. We mentioned the name of Dickie Larkin. He's running strong as well. 18 career starts for uh, Larkin. Only one in the top 10, however, that coming uh, back in 1993 when he was six. He's currently running in the number four spot. Larkin in the black number 499 showing in the screen right there. Just, just showed in the screen. We are on the uh, race communications with Jimmy Horton. We'll see what uh, is going on between Jimmy and his crew and spotters. Not much. I was going to say, I don't think much coming because Horton doesn't talk a lot under any circumstances. Maybe his father will be talking to him, but uh, Horton doesn't say a lot under uh, any situation. Very strong number one, Billy Decker. Strong number two, Kenny Tremont. Strong number three, Bud Crispin. One, two, and three at Syracuse. Well, that, you're right. They're all strong. The guy that I'm worried about in that top three, being able to go the distance, Crispin. I think they're really stretching the envelope here. Uh, fuel mileage for the Briasca car. We'll wait and see. They may have figured that was their only chance. Here's Danny Johnson now. Looking on the inside of Horton, a little contact was made. Contact made, but no damage done. Neither man will give an inch. Let's go down to Andy Fusco. Okay, now if you think the Briaski team is pushing the envelope, Gary, you're going to have to say the same thing about the Bug Chaser team. The Briaski team came in on lap 87, filled up. That means they've got 101 laps to go. The Decker team came in on lap 89. That means they've got 99 miles to go on a tank of gas. They're almost in the same exact situation. Good observation. Remember, Andy, he got the bar, that. Jimmy. Remember, he got the bar. Hearn <laughs> went, went 100 laps. Yeah. But, uh, I, of course, the deal there is in that 100 laps, how many laps were under caution? And uh, that stat we don't have available to us. Uh, so that's the whole deal. And that was what Christmas uh, crew chief told us. They, depending on the number of cautions, they'd be able to make it or not. And I'd say we've had a fair number of cautions inside of this uh, last 100 laps. So maybe they can go the distance. We'll all find out. Here is the afternoon progresses. We're now working lap number 143. Horton looks to the inside of Camara. Can't make the pass. Danny's falling back just a little bit. He's, well, he may be falling back even further. Danny, Danny's in trouble. Danny Johnson slows. Here comes Bobby Barron by. There's something wrong in the suspension of Danny Johnson's car. The wiggle just a little too much. And oh, he's hanging in there, but Barron did get him. Yeah. And uh, the other guy's uh, pulling away. Carolina, the 98. Was a scanner of Danny Johnson. Charlie DeAngelis is crew chief, and he's not talking about any problem, so maybe I'm the only one with a problem. I don't know. Let's go down. Let's, let's see what the deal is with uh, the Danny Johnson uh, crew. Andy? Hey, DeAngelis, you're the crew chief on Danny Johnson's number six. What's the problem? I don't know. We just seem to be down on power today. I don't know if it's uh, the air or what. I don't know. But I think we'll be all right here. We've got a few laps left. Right now we're turning the same time as the leaders. I don't know if those guys are going to have enough gas. I know that we got enough, so we'll have to see what happens. Is your driver saying anything about the handling? Well, we're not real. He's not real comfortable right now. It's, it's probably uh, the car right now is the best it's been all day, but we just seem to be down on motor a little bit right now. Okay. They don't really know, guys. Jimmy Horton, now Horton is slow. Jimmy Horton slows directly in front of Danny Johnson, and Danny gets by, and Horton's uh, race day is going to come up short. Jimmy Horton in turn four. Let's see if he ducks into the pits. I'm sure he will. Into the pits comes Jimmy Horton, former winner. And he'll head into his pits. No. He'll go right behind the wall. Straight to the garage. Paul Small, what do you have for us? We're not sure right now what the problem is with the Jimmy Horton car other than he took it behind the wall. The crew is not in a particular hurry to get back there, so whatever the problem is, it's obviously terminal. We'll follow up on this in a minute for you guys. All right, thank you, Cowboy. This is a shot a little further back. Pierre Bear in car number 71, the yellow 71. There we go to the yellow number 91, our race leader. Billy Decker. Randy Ross. Adam Ross cuts stone. Bug chase 
Chrysler insect repellent wristband. Olsen chassis, Kevin Enders powered automobile has been such a dominant factor in dirt motorsports competition all season long. Crash, heavy crash. Kenny That's Brightville on the wall. Turn and two. look at the shredded uh, right rear. Down. Kenny Brightville into the wall. Tough break. Maybe, just maybe, we've been talking about fuel mileage and going 100 laps on fuel. We're discounting tires. Maybe we shouldn't discount tires. That could be a problem. Obviously, it was a problem for Brightville. Kenny is able to pull away from the wall, but getting into the pits is going to be a rough drive for this veteran. A long, slow ride for the big guy from Sinking Springs, Pennsylvania. The leader, Billy Decker, Kenny Tremont, Bud Crispin, one, two, and three at Syracuse. We have 41 laps remaining in the Eckerd 300, and we are live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. Under green at the New York State Fairgrounds, Doug Logan along with Gary Montgomery and out of turn four down the front straightaway, rocketing in that number 91 buck chaser is Billy Decker, the leader. Second place, Kenny Tremont, 150. Lap 150, that gives us uh, 48 to go. Going a little further back in the field. 38 to go. Uh, you'll do the back top. Got it. <laughs> okay. Chrisman runs into the three spot. Larkin is in four. Rounding out the top five is Dave Camara. Pole position starter showing in the screen. Running six is Barron. Danny Johnson is seven. Running eight is Eddie Marshall. Nine is Alan Johnson. Ten is Frank Cozy. Eleven is Pat Ward. Timmy Guire is 12. Steve Payne is in 13. They're all on the lead lap. There's the pole sitter. Barron in the 35, and Danny Johnson in the number six. Now Danny was struggling, and now he's going to fly by on the inside as Barron struggles a little bit worse, and Danny, car six, comes to position number six. The defending race champion, daring Dan the stock car man, and Ray Bramble's RJD Trucks Toyota Plus takes over position number six. And he is the lead candidate for a former champion to take home the prize here. The first five cars would all be in the hunt for their first ever Eckerd 300 win. Danny is a tough customer, but he's got another tough customer not far behind him, his older brother. Allen just turned 41 years old, and uh, he hasn't lost any of the fire. And Mitsubishi is providing some financing. Jim Beachy has put together a team, and Allen Johnson is doing the most with what he can, and uh, with what he's got, I should say. And right now, it's good for a number nine spot as we have uh, completed lap number 153 now. Allen has had a number of near misses today. In fact, in turn three, he actually did a full circle stayed reasonably clean as you see your leader and there's the interval back to second place in Kenny Treatment. Now remember for 15 years Lebanon Valley promoter Howie Commander has offered a $5,000 bonus for a Valley regular who wins the 300. No Valley driver has ever won this race. Kenny Tremont is in position to make a run for it. Tremont is a fixture at Lebanon Valley. His dad has been there for every race they've ever run having fielded cars for a number of drivers over the years. Tremont uh, Kenny Jr. that is uh, won 12 feature races there this year. Won the track championship in the process. That's 11th of his career. Uh, they've had a good year. They're making a great year if they can win here this afternoon. He won $17,500 in the school race. He won the 200 lapper at uh, Northern Final Lebanon Valley now uh, just a few weeks ago. Decker is pulling away. Billy Decker is pulling away our race leader, second place Kenny Tremont, third Bud Chrisman. That's the way it is, and it's the way it has been for some time now. Yellows or not. Yellows or not, the yellow number 91 is, uh, has been a dominant uh, race car here all week long. Second fast time color, and an outside the number one row, one is qualifying race as well for a little $4,000 bonus. Another strong performance for Pat Ward in the 56. And he's been strong on the racetrack. Unfortunately for Patrick, they lost uh, some ground, a lot of ground on pit road. So uh, mechanical problem there getting that uh, wheel off. Uh, slowed him down, cost him some time. Cozy running in the number 10 spot, running 11 is the 56, the John Finch car, Pat Ward, second generation driver of Genoa, New York. There's another great story, the yellow number 99B, Chuck Bauer, a rookie here. Don't think 
He's in the lead lap, and he's been in the hunt very, very smooth and consistent all day long in the Courier Plastics uh, Meyer tool car. He's a shot of Bauer. Nice young fella. The nice gas man out of Lansing, New York. Well, you know, a story very early in the race was the tire situation. I'd just like to know not only the fuel because they've had to stretch it up front, but also the tire situation and tire wear. The guy getting the worst tire wear right now, I would say, is Alan Johnson. The way that chassis is twisting, he's on the well. There's Camara twisting as well. When they go tricycling like that, they're getting a lot of fight. That's run an awful lot of little weight back on that right rear and uh, can wear it out. 30 laps to go. There's Camara running in the number five spot with the red number 26. Amy Johnson close behind. There's the black Mitsubishi car. Alan Johnson, A.J. Slideways, who did a lot of winning in 358 competition this year. We talked about how he hadn't won many big block races. That, of course, was true, but he did win a bunch of small block races. He, Alan, we're talking about. In fact, won the track championship at Merrittville for Mike Maroney's small block team. Danny's trying to squeeze an extra mile an hour out of this machine. Anybody can do it. It's Daring Dan Estacker, man. Just behind Danny is Bobby Barron. You saw him lose that spot just a few moments ago when his car got out of shape. He's collected his thoughts and uh, would like to collect uh, Danny Johnson. Chrisman showing in the screen as well, running third. So third, four, five, and six, all running under a very large blanket. Uh, I think that uh, the seventh place car, Barron. It's a, oh, it's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, they're together. Some places around the racetrack, they work out of turn four and head down the front straightaway to complete lap number 161. Running up front, quite alone, is Billy Decker. Down in the pits, not alone, Andy Fusco. Yeah, no, I'm with Randy Ross. Randy owns the car. We know you think you can go 99 miles on a tank of fuel. How about the tire situation? The tire situation looks good. Uh, you know, last time we, the first set of tires, we really blew the right rear off, but the second set looked real good. And uh, we're out there conserving right now, so hopefully it's our race. The driver says he feels like a winner, so we're good to go. Yeah, the driver feels like a winner. How do you feel right now? I'm nervous, but actually I'm not as near as nervous as I've been here in years. So we came here to win this show, and it looks like we're going to do it. So hopefully in another 25 laps or so, we're up here on this big chunk of concrete on the front stretch where I've always wanted to be. He has paid his dues, he being Randy Ross. He's fielded cars here for a number of drivers over the years, and uh, Decker doing a great job for him for the last uh, two or three years that they've been together as a team. Uh, both of them are struggling independently. They got together. The marriage has worked beautifully. And uh, we've said a number of times now, Decker has uh, really been a factor throughout the 1998 racing season. Always a factor, the defending champion of this race, Danny Johnson. Don't cut him out, but he runs in six and is about a full straightaway behind our race leader. Full straightaway in a bunch of cars. Bobby Barron continues to run strong in the top ten. Let's go down to Cowboy Paul Small. And Bobby Barron may have a little bit more of an advantage than the rest of these guys. A lot of the guys at the front are worried about gas mileage. You guys don't have to worry that much. Why is that? Uh, we got a full tank on our last stop. So we're going to say. But more appropriately, you put it after lap 100. Yeah, we put it after that. So you've got a shorter distance to go. The question is, does Bobby have enough left in the car, and when's he going to turn up the wick? Uh, he's turning it up now. We've got 25 to go. So Bobby Varon and his crew are very confident. They know they've got enough gas. Now they need to know if they have enough stuff to get up there to the front. I think that will be the interesting question as we are winding down in the Eckerd 300 here at the New York State Fairgrounds. The man flying out in front is the Franklin Flyer, the number 91 Buck Chaster, Billy Decker. And our coverage of the Eckerd 300 will continue on Rush Hour. Rush Hour Super Dirt Week. Every business day, Coin Textile Services provides 60,000 customers in 25 states clean, safe working garments. Isn't it time we serve you? Image is everything. Dial 1 800 Mr. Coin. Coin Textile Services, since 1929. 
from Frontier Cellular, an offer that'll really get your motor running for a limited time. Receive 25% off any regularly priced in-stock accessory. Call 1-800-278-2501. Frontier Cellular, we're with you. Kenny Tremont runs second in our Eckerd 300, right behind this man, Billy Decker. Let's go down to Kenny Tremont's pit and Cowboy Paul Small. Anything for the leader? Not right now. We're hoping to stay where we are here. And hopefully we can don't have any problems or run out of fuel. And, uh, I'm sure the fuel's going to be tight. Now, you pitted on lap 91, and you're worried about fuel. The leader pitted two laps before you. Did he? Well, <laughs> I guess he's got the same idea. Trying to hang on. Well, that's Kenny Tremont on the, the scanner, and, and thank you, Andy Fusco, for that report from the pit of Kenny Tremont. We have just 16 laps remaining. What a log jam right here. We've got Alan Johnson trying to close in on brother Danny, who's up front. Baron looking uh, up front of this particular battle. Baron looking to the inside. They had slower cars. We have a slow car here on the front straightaway. Straight away, Pierre Hebert in car number 71, who's been chasing them all day long. He'll go a, a lap down and pull him out of the race here on lap number 173. Well, Baron's crew said he was going to turn up the wick, but you still got to pass those cars, and that's another matter altogether. Yeah, turning it up, catching him, then going around him. And I don't think there's enough wick left for Bobby Barron. I don't think there's any wick left for anybody to catch Decker if he doesn't have a problem. Well, that would be a problem with fuel. Kenny Tremont, 17th career start, top finish second, 93, currently running second. And uh, the, the Tremont plan concerned about fuel mileage. And then when you factor in what Andy mentioned, that, hey, Billy Decker came in two laps earlier. You saw the reaction. Yeah, he couldn't believe it. Was, uh, Ken Tremont Senior, they call him Abe, and uh, for obvious reasons, if you got a good look at the gentleman, he's a nice guy. And here's a, another battle further back in the back. Timmy Dwyer in the red car number 1A. He runs in the lead lap, and he's just moved around with Tittle Z car in the lead lap, but at the back of the lead lap. Alan Johnson slowing on the back straight away. So Alan Johnson now, no, excuse me. Well, that's Jimmy Horton. Horton back out. Well, that's the second time I've done that today. The leader continues to be Billy Decker, and he has a considerable lead of about two and a half to three seconds on Kenny Tremont. And, you know, they mentioned in the pits of Billy Decker that he was just conserving right now. Yeah, uh, conserving. Well, everybody's got their definition of conservation, I guess. But he doesn't have, he's got a clean racetrack. He doesn't have to worry about getting around anybody. So even though he's faster than everybody else, uh, he can run his line and uh, get on it and off of it when he wants to. Uh, nobody breathing down his back bumper. So uh, maybe he is conserving, but uh, he's not uh, far off the pace that he's been running here for the last uh, 60 or 70 laps. So Decker continues to lead the field and look for his first ever Eckert 300 win. Just a dozen laps away from the checkered flag. Let's go down to Billy Decker's pit. We're down here in the Decker pit, and everybody right now has kind of got their fingers crossed. I would think you getting nervous yet? No. The way we got to calculate, we should be able to make a fuel mileage, no problem. We're just going to have to wait and see. If Kenny comes up there to give Billy a run, does he have enough to hold him back? Oh, yeah. We're holding back right now. We're just trying to save fuel and tires. That's all confidence from the Decker crew. They're looking forward to their first Decker 300 win, and they're not too far away from Been getting made. Everything is looking very, very smooth. Decker has run in 11 prior events. He was 27th here last year. He's doing a good job, pal. Doing a real good job. 1994. But he's doing. won here on the mile. In fact, his most recent win was here on the 4th of July. Ten laps to go. Race communications with Billy Decker. And another car slowed on the track. That's Butch Tittle, the Z car. Slows, sheds a tire. That'll tighten things up if he doesn't clear. You see the 15 leaders. lead, 15. Coming out. Car up on right top. behind Tittle. Will it force a yellow? That could be a key. Cozy makes a stop. Apparently they were too close on fuel. That could be costly if, in fact, the yellow does come out. Not yet, it hasn't. So. Remaining green. And now that car's going to stop. 
Yeah, it's uh, oh my. Not clear, and the yellow does come out. Oh, what a costly, costly uh, time for Cozy to make a stop. With eight laps remaining, when Billy Decker comes around, the yellow flag is out at Syracuse, and we are going to have a sprint race to the checkered flag here in the Eckerd 300. We'll be right back to bring you the final laps of the world's richest race on dirt. We are live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour. Super Dirt Week. six-lap sprint to the finish. Billy Decker is the leader. Kenny Tremont is second. Bud Chrisman third. Dickie Larkin fourth. Dave Camara rounding out the top five as we get set to go green. The field now heads into turn three. Danny Johnson, Bobby Viren, Eddie Marshall, Alan Johnson, Pat Ward, Tim Dwyer, and, and the 7X of Steve Van the Cars in the lap 12. Kenny, the Hampshire car link set back. To go. Car link back. Let's go, buddy. Bring it right now. Bring Billy it, bring Decker, it, bring Decker, it. Richie. Billy Decker, pedal down. Keep bringing it, buddy. Keep bringing it. Has the lead. Two down the front two. straightaway. Into bump. turn one. Kenny Tremont about a car length behind. Last ditch effort for Kenny Tremont here, the final six laps. But Decker has answered the six challenge lead. once six. again. Excellent. He's got Restart, that lead. Excellent. Excellent and the job. conservation of fuel, the best conservation program that any driver could have hoped for was a caution. They got it late. That could be the difference that uh, would suspect puts the fuel uh, question out of the question and not be a factor now. And they lost lead. their lead, but Good look, job. right off the bat, a yeah, one second lead. Go. Full one Five second lead Let's right run. now for Billy Decker. A little further back, that's uh, defending champion Danny Johnson trying to run around the number 26 of uh, Camara to take over the number 5 spot, but it doesn't work at the moment. Everybody, single file, down the back straight away, into turn 3. There'll be 4 to go when they come to the line this time. Crispin holds on to 3 with Larkin close behind in the black number 99. Tries to pick up one more spot. Final four laps of the Eckerd 300. There is the Franklin Flyer in the interval to second place Tremont. Nobody's holding back now, Doug. Everything that they've got, they're showing it all, and it looks like everybody's just going to parade around in position. Nobody able to mount a serious challenge in our uh, top ten cars. If Decker Ready can to go. hold on, ten he'll lead, win this ten, championship by 16 lead. points. If it ends as is, close, close. Stop. Turn up to lead. 14. Kenny Tremont finished second to Pete Bicknell in yesterday's 358 modified 200. And Pat we Ward. have Pat Ward in trouble. Oh, my. On lap 185. Tenth position car. Pat Ward slows. Two laps to go. Yeah. He's Don't up against around, the yeah. wall. Will he be able to nurse it in? Tremont is out of gas. Tremont out of gas. Kenny Tremont has slowed on the race course. Oh, what a revolting development this is. Now, this conservation deal, they got to go the last three under green, Doug. So this could be a factor before it's over yet. And Pat Ward has stopped on the track. Extra laps now. It will be an extra lap situation here in Syracuse. And I'll tell you, Billy Decker has to be on pins and needles. There's... Uh, Kenny Tremont Sr., he's not on pins and needles any longer. There's the famous Tremont pose. And, uh, too bad for the nice guy from West Sand Lake, New York. Second yesterday, you just said it. I was thinking out two seconds, not what anybody wants, but better than third or fourth or whatever. He'll come up dry here this afternoon. We will have a green, white, then checkered. Let's go down uh, to Paul Small. Paul? Camara's out of gas. When, excuse me. When you talk about calculating right down to the last lap, Somehow, some way, sometimes you have the random factors like this where you may run a couple of laps past 188. I don't think anybody planned on this happening. You guys, the faces fell in here big time when that yellow came out. Do you have enough for the extra couple of laps that you may not have planned on? I guess we're all just going to wait and see, aren't we? <laughs> I have no clue. 
We'll find out here in a few minutes. Let's go further up pit road to Andy Fusco. Okay, we're out here with the Tremont team, and my, 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 are they disconsolate. Kenny Tremont Sr., you said it earlier, you were worried about fuel mileage. Yeah. Right now, worried about a record getting this car in here so we can put it in. Here we go. Ready, guys. Okay, okay, here comes the Tremont 115 in. You guys have already established upstairs that this could go more than 188 miles because of the way the dirt rules say the race must end. Tremont takes on one can of gas. That should be enough to get him to the finish, but as Gary said, they've run dry today. Well, we'll see. Billy Decker is the leader. Bud Chrisman is second. Dickie Larkin third. There's Danny Johnson now fourth, boys. and Bobby Varon fifth. Eddie Marshall sixth, way, Alan guys. Johnson seven. And beyond that, I can't tell you. It's uh, too confusing. And I think perhaps Pat Ward may have simply run out of gas as well. That we thought that maybe he had a problem. He did. No. Pitted on lap 94. Top five cars all pitted on lap 90 or so. How much fuel is left? That's the question. Yes, we are going extra laps. They'll get the green on lap number 189. They'll get the white on lap number 190. And they'll get the checkered flag on 191 unless we have another problem. Decker, Chrisman. Chrisman, what a storybook deal this is. Now, we know that they're right on the ragged edge with fuel. He started inside row 10. Bud Chrisman, what a ride. And we're going to be going green here. Pace car pulls in. Here comes Billy Decker. He's flying out of turn four. Down the front straightaway. Green, white, and then checkered flag. Six, Billy Decker six. running smoothly. He's been the big story all day up front. Billy Decker now into turn two. But Crispin about six or seven car lengths behind. Decker continues to impress. Decker stretches 12, out at his edge of about a quarter of a straightaway. 12 uh, car lengths, I guess is that was probably what Scott Jeffrey was telling him as crew chief. White flag flies as they complete lap number 190. They call it the movie mile. Right is White there flag, one nice mile big remaining lead, in that Take gas tank of Billy Decker? Mile big remaining lead, in that Take gas tank of Billy Be Decker. Patient. He's in the turn ride. one. Now turn two still continues to go smoothly. Lengthening his lead on Bud Crispin. Down the back straightaway. Billy Decker in the Bud Chaser number 91. 15 lead, 15. Into turn three, still job, looking pal. smooth. Track champion at Brewerton. Track champion at Canandaigua. Track champion at Cuda County. Crowning the racing year of his career. The checkered flag is out. Billy Decker is the winner of the Eckerd 300. The flight back to North Carolina is going to be real short now, pal. Thanks. Bud Crispin across the finish right line, now. second, Billy Decker. Let's go down to the pits with Billy Decker and Paul Small. Well, we're down here with Randy Ross, the car owner. You guys came here on a mission. You were focused. You done it. Yes, we did. I'll tell you what. I can't thank the guys enough. I can't thank all my sponsors enough. I can't thank them right now, but I know I'm going to be up there in that chunk of concrete. That's where I've always wanted to be. I'm going to let you go right there. Congratulations. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. First ever win here in the Eckerd 300. First ever Skoll Championship to Billy Decker pulling into victory lane. We'll be back to talk to our race champion, Billy Decker, after this timeout. We're live from Syracuse on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. Back at Syracuse, and it's time to go down to victory lane and meet our race winner, Billy Decker, standing by Cowboy Paul Small. Billy Decker with a thumbs up. Congratulations. You finally won the Eckerd 300. Now where are you going? I'm going to Eckerd's in, Eckerd's in Baldwinville tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be there making a personal appearance tomorrow as the winner of the Eckerd 300. You guys came into this week so focused. I don't think we saw you smile except maybe once all week. You really, really wanted to win this race. No, we sure did. You know, uh, we want to stay focused. There's a lot on the line here other than Super Dirt Week. You know, there's also uh, uh, the Dirt Points Championship that we're in the hunt for. And uh, we just wanted to have a good, clean week. You know, we've been here and then uh, had a car enough to win the race. And we just didn't want to fail again. You know, these guys did one heck of a job. We brought the same car we brought last year, this Olsen Eagle. And we had some, some Trek AFCO shocks on there. And this uh, new Kevin Enders motor was working super. You know, this 
I'm happy for my car owner and my team. You know, they did a hell of a job. I can only imagine what was going through your mind when those last couple of yellow flags came out and you knew you were stretching the fuel to the limit. Well, nobody was saying nothing on the radio like we were getting close. We were just trying to stay calm and collective. And when I got to lead here, I was really conserving on gas, you know, rolling out of the throttle a little early, not on all the way to the floor when I didn't have to be, you know. We are just trying to conserve, 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 and man, it worked out great. So I take it there was no sputtering and spitting in this motor at the end? Uh, there wasn't nothing wrong with this baby at the end. The whole car was sound and true. Well, congratulations. You've earned your first Decker 300 win, and I know you wanted this one real, real bad. Yeah, we certainly did, and I'd like to thank all the fans here for supporting it. All right, Billy Decker getting ready to climb out of the car here. He may have also won the Skull Championship with his win in the Eckerd 300 here this afternoon. Guys? What a run by Billy Decker. And we want to stay with this so you can see the celebration as he gets out of his car. And officially, he did win the Skull Championship, and he strengthens his lead in the midst of dirt hunt as well. It's a phenomenal year. Second-generation driver. We don't talk about that much, but his dad, Floyd, a great racer a few years back as well. Yeah, he could uh, win the Dirt Triple Crown, the Skull, the Eckerd 300, and the Mr. Dirt Championships. He wins the Eckerd 300 in his 12th start here at Syracuse. And it was just an outstanding, exciting day for Billy Decker. And how about Bud Chrisman finishes second? Outstanding run for Bud in his third ever start. His best finish prior to today was last year, 22nd. So what an improvement there. Dickie Larkin, the veteran out of Sheffield, Massachusetts, he had such a frustrating year. He quit midway through the season. He comes home to finish three. Defending champion Danny Johnson is four. Bobby Barron from the pole finishes five. And Alan Johnson recovers from a couple of near misses to finish six. Then it's Eddie Marshall, Tim Dwyer, Steve Payne, Dave Dave Camara, Tim Fuller, and Kenny Tremont rounding out the top 12. The winner of the Eckert 300 for 1998, Billy Decker. And our coverage will continue from the New York State Fairgrounds live on Rush Hour. Rush Hour, Super Dirt Week. Billy Decker wins from outside the first row, finishing second from inside row number 10 is Bud Crispin, and let's hear from Bud with Andy Fusco. Bud, you guys couldn't be happier if you'd won the thing. Um, the crew did a great job. I'm sure they're all happy. I'm happier than anything. Uh, we just wanted to be there at the end, and uh, we ran out of fuel on the last lap. Uh, they, they calculated the fuel perfectly all week. They've been working on every lap we ran, how much fuel we were going to use. Did you ever think you could come to Syracuse and get a podium finish? Uh, yeah, I think I don't think we'd be here if we didn't think that. Buddy Chrisman, great job. Another guy with a top three finish today. Dickie Larkin, great job. Yeah, thanks very much. I, <laughs> I can't say enough for everybody that helped me get here and all the people back home that sponsored me. And everybody up front was worried about fuel, were you? I ran out. I had to be pushed in over the scale. We were right down to the end. But I'll tell you, I thank uh, Bicknell Carr and my crew and all my friends that helped me get here and I'll tell you what it was all worth it I mean this to me is like a win I haven't done anything all year long and we did it today a lot of happy faces and empty gas tanks down here in Victory Lane <laughs> we spoke earlier of the changing of the guard well two of the top three are racing veterans but uh, they're really cashing in today at Syracuse they certainly are and uh, a first time winner Billy Decker coming up in a couple weeks we will see you down in Middletown New York for Eastern States weekend Stand by for the most important racing weekend of the year. For the first time in history, the Mr. Dirt titles will be decided during the CarQuest Eastern States weekend. Saturday's CarQuest 150 pits Alan Johnson against all comers. The defending Mr. Small Block was almost unbeatable this year. Two in a row would be sweet. Sunday's CarQuest 200 is wide open. Decker, Hearn, Tremont, Johnson. Whoever gets around that nasty track rules dirt. Tighten up your wigs and fire up the pacemakers for the CarQuest Eastern States weekend. If you can't get there, Rush Hour will turn every lap for you. It's racing like it should be. A great victory for Billy Decker, the winner of the 1998 Eckert 300. For Kevin Kovac, Gary Montgomery, Paul Small, Andy Fusco, and the entire Rush Hour and Dirt crew, Doug Logan saying thank you for joining us, and so long for now.